The follow program does not have a normal intro because I was really too busy smoothing other things over to get it done. So, Corey? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the following program. I'm your host, Joe Nierman, a.k.a. Good Logic. By now, you've almost certainly heard about the tragedy that occurred down in the Baltimore region where the cargo ship Dolly crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge and collapsed it. Most of us recognize it for the tragedy that it is. It really is genuinely a tragedy. And at this point, search and rescue has been abandoned. In fact, it's gone to search and recovery. I certainly hope that uh, for the for the victims and their families that their bodies are quickly recovered. And uh, there's a lot of speculation about this story. There's a lot of speculation about this story as to what it is that was going on here. Should this have happened? Should this not have happened? Were there measures available that could have prevent accidents like this from happening? And there is some speculation online that uh, there's terrorism involved here. Now, I explored this when I was covering it on playback earlier today. I, I urge you to check that out because it was a pretty comprehensive breakdown of all these different issues. But I do I was I did have a clip shared with me that I've not yet had a vet, had an opportunity to vet myself. But it's exploring this concept. And again, when I'm when I am covering this, I don't want anyone to say that you know Joe thinks this was a terrorist activity. I, I I'm not I don't think that. I don't know. That's I'm simply, I'm simply able to admit when I just don't know. And unfortunately, we're living in a world today where I think it's it's foolish to just rule out any possibility. I think it's a, it's conspiracy theory to just say either way definitively before you know. Either way, you're just theorizing and you're pretending that you know. And I think that it's healthiest to basically say, I don't know. I'm willing to listen and then apply logic to based on the arguments that are presented. So, you know, one person who I don't think is behind, if it was terrorism was involved, there's a suspect that you might think, you might be thinking of, you should be thinking of, because this is a guy who uh, clearly thinks that our, our bridges and tunnels are a danger, or at least a menace to our American way of life, because... Our Secretary of Transportation thinks that they're incredibly, incredibly racist. The pass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach, or it would have been, uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by. But that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. Obviously. Um, obviously. If you were looking at any video footage of the bridge last night, it looked like it was wearing blackface. Do we have anything to lose by confronting that simple reality? <laughs> yeah, let's 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 confront that simple reality, that very simple reality that the purposes in the way that they were designed was designed to be racist. And I think we have everything to gain by acknowledging it and then dealing with it, which is why the reconnecting communities, that billion dollars, is something we want to get to work right away. So there you go. There you go. That's our Secretary of Transportation who wants to remind you that bridges and tunnels are racist. Woo! There. <laughs> it never, it never ends. It never ends. In never ends there. But despite that, that insane perspective by our Secretary of Transportation, I don't think he personally was involved. And anything, anything that relates to this tragedy. But some people are speculating that this flaw in the design and protection of the support beams for the Francis Scott Key Bridge is a flaw that we see rampant throughout the country. And they point to methods which could have prevented, likely would have prevented this tragedy from unfolding with the disastrous results that we all have seen. Engineers blame $3 million structural flaw for Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsing, and tens of thousands of bridges across the U.S. could also have fault because no bridge can withstand millions of pounds of force from a strike. This was a cargo ship, which they say 
weighed roughly 100,000 tons. And it was moving at a rate of between seven and eight knots when it struck. That's even with them throwing the anchor down, trying to stop the, the ship from barreling into the support beam for the bridge. Fortunately, there was a mayday call, which went out from the ship when they saw that they were having power issues, which made the, uh, the alert controllers of the bridge stop traffic flow from crossing the bridge in the moments preceding the collision and most assuredly, most heroically saved countless numbers of lives, countless numbers of lives. And we should uh, applaud the the quick action of both people on board the ship and those who are on land who helped avert what most almost certainly would have been a loss of dozens of, if not potentially hundreds of lives. Now, fortunately, this was not during rush hour, but still. And if you're watching three minutes beforehand, you see tons of cars going over. And during the 30 seconds or so before the collision, there's no car traffic. And the only victims that they know of right now are those who are construction workers who are working on the bridge who tragically did not have an opportunity to get off the bridge before it collapsed. So that being said, even though this fortunately was not the tragedy that it could have been, this still is definitely a, a, a memorable tragedy in American history. And the question is whether we should be taking steps to better preserve our bridges from this type of destruction, whether that destruction results from negligence, mechanical failure, or, or malignant behavior by terrorists. So they point out in this in this article here, brought down the Daily Mail, which says that um, no structure, no bridge could withstand millions of pounds of force from a strike, according to engineers, which they estimate that there was roughly three million pounds of pressure that was applied by the ship onto the support beam. But there are structures that can protect the bridge from being struck by a ship. And engineers have blamed the, the deadly collapse of the Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge on a design flaw that is present in tens of thousands of U.S. bridges. Several experts told DailyMail.com that the, the Maryland Bridge was missing critical protection systems that could have stopped the nearly 105,000-ton container ship from smashing into the bridge's support. The Francis Scott Key Bridge was built in 1977, and anti-collision devices like fenders or protection cells were not introduced until the 1980s. Experts say installing fenders would cost at least $3 million. But the collapse means a $15 million per dollar per day loss in economic activity and $1.5 million daily in state and local taxes. And that doesn't include the six men who are presumed dead. Video of the 1.6 mile long Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsing into the Patapsco River after a cargo ship struck one of its piers at low speed created a surreal scene as the entire bridge appeared to crumble in one fell swoop. I assume by now you've seen that scene. This is the aftermath of it. But what was interesting to me, and they talk about the ship, which I assume you know most of this information. I don't want to give you information that I assume that you know, but it was called the Dolly. It was traveling around nine miles an hour. And it took down a pair of bridge piers, which left the roadway totally unsupported. And they talk about these anti-collision devices like fenders or protection cells, which they actually have a picture and I was just like, I was astonished. This is like what this is like what these fenders can look like. And basically, they're metal structures that stick out like guardrails, so that if it gets too close to the pier, that would presumably impede the ship, perhaps ripping a hole in the ship. But that would be superior to it ripping it down a bridge. So these are the the guardrails that they're talking about. And they also show this thing here, which is if you look at this circular structure in and that they basically place a sort of like a bumper kind of guardrail that forces ships to go around the around this this metal bumper area it sort of makes you ask the question like shouldn't we have this around every one of our bridges and obviously we need it probably on both sides i assume uh, both sides of the pylon doesn't it make sense to have this like around any bridge that has any kind of significance? I don't know. To me, this to me this seems to be 
common sense. I don't know if they can put it in after the bridge has been built. Doesn't seem like it would be precluded from happening. Maybe maybe there is a problem from an engineering perspective with managing to put this in on bridges that don't already have it. I don't know. I don't know. The Maryland Transit Authority owns and operates the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And Daily Mail reached out about why there were not sufficient protective structures built around it. To build a bridge with piers are strong enough to withstand a blow from such a vessel. Quote, you'll end up just building a castle in the middle of the river. Be Bilal IU, former chair of the American Society of Civil Engineers Infrastructure Resilience Division, told Daily Mail. When one major piece failed in Tuesday's crash, the weight of the bridge had nothing else to support it and nowhere else to go but down. Based on the videos, it appears that the boat leaned against one of the A-frame pillars holding up the bridge. And the brilliant, there's a certain brilliance with the way they structure these bridges. I actually watched a video on this years ago. I'm not professing to be any sort of expert in this area at all because i sure as hell not. But apparently, they actually, when they first were, were coming up with how to design these these um, bridges in a way that can support that kind of weight is that they, they instead of having a straight pillar supporting it, they tend to have a more of an A design. So the further it's going, you know, I'm not talking about this specific bridge. You can even see in, in the picture here that this A type of structure means that the weight that pushes into it, forcing the, the girders outward, actually makes it creates a smaller requirement of mass to support the weight, which is pretty intelligent, actually. Anyhow, the way the bridge collapsed the remaining pillar, and without that support, the bridge's span became very large, El Tawil said, and it was never designed for that. In other words, a long, expensive roadway was left with nothing to hold it up. El Tawil and the other engineers said the Francis Scott Key Bridge seemed to lack the necessary structures that were protected against such a strike. Piers in the water, seafloor piled up to make a ship run aground before it strikes the pillar, or concrete structures that could divert the boat away from the bridge. According to Ayub, there are features that can be built into waterways to divert a runaway boat from hitting the crucial structures of a bridge. You cannot design a bridge to withstand the energy that comes from moving objects as large as a barge. Instead, engineers can develop ways to keep ships from hitting bridges. You can see there how that sort of serves to protect the, the integrity of the bridge. Seems kind of logical. Bridge fenders. One way Ayub says to find a navigation channel to divert ships from hitting the crucial piers whose failure would collapse the bridge. Other options include steel protection cells or fender systems surrounding the bridge piers, as well as seafloor dredging that would pile up material around the pier and make a ship run aground before it collides with the bridge. Basically, what they will do is they'll make ground underwater elevate higher so the ship will be grounded, he explained. It was designed to basically alert the operator that you know you're approaching an object. None of these appear to be in place around the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Ayub and other civil engineering experts told DailyMail.com. So now there's all sorts of speculation that we need to have this sort of protection around all of our bridges. There are worse ideas, I'll tell you that. There are worse ideas. So that's the speculation on that. That's the that's that's the red on that. Reform Convict says, number 13 here, they should have dug a tunnel like a, See, this is, no one listens to me. No one listens to us. No one listens to us. Uh, obvious, this is obvious. Obvious. It's like, hello. Hey, I did all the welding on that first bridge with bumpers, Matthews, Virginia. Did you really? Cool. Well, good job. I wish they hired you to take care of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Well, as he says, as inspector, they need to improve build bridge structures. Much of our current infrastructure over 50 years old, there are modern approaches to all this aged infrastructure. Well, there's no such thing as a as a as an infrastructure bill that a Democrat didn't love. That we know. So you're sort of surprised almost like how this not happen to like every bridge of ours by now. Every year, every time there's a problem with the economy, it's like, let's redo the infrastructure all over again. So I, I don't know that we can just continually just update and modernize our bridges every time we have a new advancement. That seems to be 
kind of crazy, but I do think that having protections to help ensure the bridge's integrity, to me, that, that sounds fairly, fairly straightforward and relatively inexpensive. You're saying it costs $3 million? I don't know if it's $3 million for one guardrail or if it's $3 million for the entire bridge. I have a feeling it's more than $3 million for the bridge. That's my gut. My gut says it's more than $3 million for the bridge. But you should take care of the, the bigger ones first. Anyway, I mentioned to you that there's speculation as to whether or not this calamity is a result of terrorist activity. Oh, and Hans says, Argentina cutting 70,000 government workers on top of the first 50K. I can only help USA can one up and cut a million of our 2.9 million federal jobs. Afuera! Obviously, YouTube wouldn't allow that as a super chat. Why would they allow that? Bildo says, y'all, this is a really sad topic. You know what's not? The fact that I'm getting closer to 200 followers here on Rumble. Check me out. Bildozer74. Follow, like, share, all the good things, all the good algorithm things. That's Bildozer over on Rumble. So, yeah, dude's inching up, inching up, inching up on 200. We all know that getting followers on Rumble. It requires a real commitment from your from your base. All right. So Steve Bannon had on this woman who was speculating. I read her whole Twitter thread on this, explaining why she thinks that this is a result of terrorist activity. And before I pull this up, I know some of you may have joined late and may not have seen it. This is not my way of advocating and saying and saying I believe that this there was any sort of terrorist activity that was related to this incident. Definitely, I'm not saying that. I'm simply not willing to just rule it out without at least considering it. So this is my effort to actually considering it. And that's that's what I think is that's how you become informed. It's like you hear from a perspective. And now I'm going to see, does this make sense to me? And where am I at after I hear it, before I get there? Is the following going to have bumpers around its bridge for our island? Wait, well, we don't have an island. What what if we have leader caves? Are we going to put bumpers around our cave for sure? Uh, that's that's really a higher level i think that's above your that's above your pay grade tj it's a little bit above that's for like you know the 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 other followers they're above my pay grade too those other followers there's certain followers who are far more dedicated to the following than i am i they make me they shame me shame me shame me Amazing just dedication and devotion. Devout followers. That's what we would call them, devout followers. I don't know if I qualify as a devout follower. I just, I, I don't know. Some of them are, though. Some of them are really devout. So, and they have their own clicks and stuff like that in very friendly ways and in very inviting ways. Legal Vices, member for 17 months. Mm. This is in no way terrorism. Rule out, Joe. Just rule it out. There's no chance whatsoever that I had was terrorism. Sometimes I do know things. All right. I'm going to send you an invite. Just come on here for 10 minutes and tell me why it's impossible that this is terrorism. Okay? I'm going to send you... I was, look, this is... You are the, the old man in the sea. You got your whole naval pipe and stuff there. I get it. I, I'm not questioning. I would certainly... I defer to your infinitely greater naval knowledge than I will ever possess or actually have any ambition to to possess to be honest with you I, I don't want to know as much about the sea as you know old man however i think that now that th this if you could pop in here and just express to me why it is that this is just utterly 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 impossible no way no how just crazy talk i'd appreciate it i appreciate it. i'm gonna send you a link right now you don't have to. You don't have to come in. There's no pressure, but I am putting pressure on you. <laughs> When's the last time I put pressure on you? I don't remember ever putting pressure on anyone. So, no. You know what? I am putting pressure on you. You don't have to come in here for like an hour or two hours or anything like that. But a quick stop by. I sent you the link. Okay? I always say no pressure. Hell with that today. Today, there's pressure on you, legal vices. You just made a definitive statement. I know you've been a member here for 17 months, and I credit you and love you for that, my brother. But yeah, just tell me. Tell me how. Tell me how it's insanity. Need to take care of the racist bridges for yes. Well, that, fortunately, it was one of the ra more more racistier bridges that was brought down. Buffers. We don't have to be automatic escalators. I consider it like bowling, like bowling. 
protects our ports outgoing and incoming. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Our ports are important. I sent him the link. We'll see if legal devices is able, is able to pop on in. Oh, he's on his way. All right. While he's on his way here, I'm going to show you a report that he thinks is totally bogus. Guys around, I don't know how they steered it at eight knots right into the, the foundational element of the bridge. They could have dropped anchor. They should have had backup systems. You say there may be something. That, and here's the other thing that's concerned me. Why they run to the mic head? McCabe on this morning on, on at sunrise on CNN uh-huh. saying it's not terrorism. Not it's not terrorism. It's uh-huh. not ter- It might not be terrorism. But why do you come to the mic right away? These are the type we need facts. We need empirical evidence. We need an investigation. What, what is your investigation telling you? Well, I have a better question for you, Steve. Why are you coming to the mic telling the country that it's not terrorism when your own intelligence uh, agencies are telling you it is? And I know they are because I didn't make this up. These are not my words, right? I'm talking to people who are on the inside, some who are on active duty, some who are rich. Now, I don't know if she's legit or a crackpot. And from what I'm understanding, when legal advice is come in here, comes in here, he's going to say that she's a crackpot. Like I said, I just listen and I just... And I'll let you consider, and I'll give you what thoughts I have after hearing her, but here we go. Tired, and everyone, literally, from critical infrastructure in Department of Homeland Security to the intelligence agencies, they know there's no other, it, it's, there, this is a cyber attack on a critical infrastructure corridor for the United States. This is, you know, for those people who think this is just a river, this is in Baltimore, what does this matter? You don't know anything about what you're talking about. This, the I-94 corridor on the Eastern seaboard is literally what connects the North and South. And when I talk about hazardous materials, right? This is a brilliant, well-planned strategic attack on one of the most important supply chains in the United States. Of- now, I'm not distinct, I'm, I wanna be clear here and critically analyze what she's saying. I am not disputing that this bridge might have significant importance. That doesn't mean that this wasn't purely an accident. You know, the fact that it might have great importance as far as enabling us to ship hazardous material back and forth, north to south, or that this might have an impact on fuel prices up here in the Northeast, definitely could. Definitely could. I don't know. I don't know. But that doesn't make it a terrorist activity rather than an accident of america the only other one is in the western side in california that's the only one that's busy and what you have does you, you now have shut it down and when i talk about hazardous materials what are we talking about here this is refined fuels right this is propane gas this is diesel this is fuel this is flammable materials this is oversized loads nitrogen chemicals everything that you need for your economy to move has literally just been shut down for four to five years and and how did they do it? They knew that they... I don't think it's shut down four to five years. Obviously, they're going to find a workaround. So I don't... It, it can slow things down. But shut down for four to five years sounds ridiculous. Like, it's not like they're not going to be shipping any of this stuff north to south in the next four years. That sounds to me to be crazy. They had to target one of two main anchor points on that bridge. There are two load-bearing pylons that any structural engineer can identify that are on the end of each side of the bridge. These are the ones that are thicker and stronger than anything else on that bridge. And when you hit one of those pylons, when you take that out, the reason you see so much of that bridge collapse instantly is you just bought 50% of the span of that bridge coming crumbling down. And what you don't see beneath the surface of the water, Steve, is absolutely catastrophic. It is a structural nightmare and a logistical nightmare because you have the entire bottom part, the concrete part of that bridge, and you don't know the extent of the structural damage to that. And you won't know it until you pull all of that infrastructure out of there and you get to look at it. And so you're talking three to five years at best And what you're talking about here is probably building a new bridge. So what you have effectively done now, you've shut down the I-95 corridor that's above ground. If this was intentional rather than purely an accident or some sort of mechanical error or captain's error. Yeah, that, 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 okay, if it's intentional, you can understand why this would be strategically advantageous, but that doesn't make it intentional just because it's, uh, because it's a more, just because it may be a more crippling blow to America's ability to 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 move 
hazardous material back and forth, that doesn't make it an act of terrorism. That just means that it's a, it's it's more of a financial hit than most of us probably would have realized. So now you're going to have to go north to New York. You're going to have to go south to North Carolina, and your and your your trucks, your hazardous materials are going to have to go around Baltimore. Now they're not going to be able to go through it. And what else did you do? You shut down the sea corridor, the shipping corridor, because now the port is shut down, right? And so all those tankers that are out at sea that have hazardous materials on them, those are going to have to all be rerouted. And why? That's a relatively much shorter term thing. Now it might take them a couple months to clear this out enough that you can get ships to go through into those ports in Baltimore again. But that's obviously a much shorter term damage. Why can you not move hazardous materials through the tunnel? Why is this such a big deal? Because they created that bridge because hazardous materials, for example, oversized loads, they don't fit in the tunnel system. Yeah. And there's other um, loads that are yeah. so dangerous that you they require, A, they require a permit. It takes time to get a permit. It costs money to get a permit. It requires an escort, right? You've seen it on the highways sometimes. You've seen when they, you have these massive oversized loads and they've got escorts all around them, these huge convoys. Well, what do you do on one of the busiest corridors in the United States? You don't shut it down in the day so this can happen. That means you can only move this stuff at night, um, which automatically impacts the amount of traffic that you can use. The tunnel is going to be overloaded. This is what you call death by a thousand cuts. It is an absolutely catastrophic you're, you're, attack on critical infrastructure. Again, all of this is just is just a detailed analysis, which may be correct. I'm not disputing anything she's saying so far. None of this points to the fact that this was intentional rather than purely an accident. I mean, some people say there's no such thing as coincidence. Okay, all right, you know, but... This doesn't mean that there was anything intentional. And if it was intentional, you sort of have to figure out how did that happen? They, they, they pay off a captain? Like, what's happening here? And you cannot see it because a cyber attack is unseen. Just like the attack on 2020 on the voting okay. machine that you cannot see. All right, before he asks her questions, I got, I know he's, I know Legal Vice is coming in soon, so I want to take these off first. Pam says, it's not always the construction, i.e. is often the design. There's no redundancy in that bridge. Structures are designed so if one member falls, other members take the forces. The bridge crumbled the house of cards. Well, it was built in 1977. So perhaps, you know, that were, that's the, that's part of the problem here. You know, it is, it is relatively an older bridge. Also close to D.C. traffic kerfuffle. That's true. Bella Stella hit me with 10... Good logic memberships. God bless you, Bella Stella. You are awesome. Awesome doesn't even begin to describe Bella Stella. It really doesn't. Oh, that was loud. That was loud. Um, yeah, the following people are now members of the... Oh, I can't get it. Well, 10 of you. 10 of you owe her congrats. Sorry, I just pulled up on... I only get. I only can see who got it when I open up the stream on YouTube itself rather than just keeping the chat open from StreamYard, so... We dig our tunnels extra big. They can use our tunnels for a fee. <laughs> I like your thinking. I like your thinking. I like your thinking. And you all thought you you all thought that Fanny working our way through our tunnels was a bad thing. No, no. We accommodate that girth. We accommodate that girth. Nothing that woman said about trucking is correct. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So you're basically saying she's a crackpot. You think she's a crackpot, and she may be. They dropped anchor. Handspack says they dropped anchor on the right side that that they then grabbed and drove into the bridge, plus a crosswind and no rudder control. I'm not sure whether you're saying that makes it intentional or or clumsier, or they that was predictable. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to take from that. Hands. Bildo says Joe redacted a great segment on this earlier. The ship was supposed to be heading out to sea, but then changed direction to go toward the bridge. I don't know either way. Interesting though. I actually shared earlier. Uh, clip which was showing how it was heading down the left side of the shipping corridor and then after it lost its power it veered significantly significantly toward the right but i'm not going to review that now i'm not going to be doing that now because you can all go over and check that out on playback and you can watch it there where i broke that down that was near the very end of the playback if you don't want to go through the whole thing 
it was like the last 10 minutes is when I ended up covering that. So, um, yeah, anyhow, let's go, let's, let me get back into, to this woman's claims of terrorism. Okay, I want to go. You just had this big thing with the FBI talking about the, what the Chinese Communist Party's uh, cyber hacking unit that they've been monitoring uh -huh. for 10 years, and now they're saying it's out of control. Are your sources telling you that they, they feel that there's enough information out there that it is a cyber attack, and is it a state actor or non-state actors? 100%, yes. And um, they are saying that this is a cyber attack. You didn't have a terrorist group board the ship and commandeer it and take it over. You had somebody take hack into the systems on board the ship, the GPS system, and reroute that ship. They did it in the middle of the night because they didn't want the crew to be awake. They didn't want everybody to be on full high alert. They wanted everybody to be asleep and you trying to wake people up and rouse people because when, when I spoke to one individual who knows, who has, let's just say he worked in Baltimore for many, many years. See, I don't like anonymous sources. I don't like when it comes from the left. I don't like when it comes from the right. I don't like this whole anonymous source thing. Name names. If a person's not willing to put their name on it, then then in that case, uh, it's it's like, this is like when people say, you know, it's uh, Trump in back rooms basically says that uh, he hates Mexicans and black people and Jews. It's like, I, I just, just give me, I need, I need a name and I need, I need, I need, facts or at least allegations that someone is willing to put someone with knowledge is willing to put their name behind it otherwise this is to me it's now i gotta trust you that i'm hearing this third hand i have to trust that you understood correctly what this other person may have misunderstood themselves and then you're conveying it to me and i'm understanding this is like so many levels of hearsay that it's just it's very frustrating what's not frustrating is Aaron Hack gifting 10 good logic memberships? God bless you, Aaron Hack. Now I do have that up there, and I can share with you that the people who were who are the beneficiaries of Aaron's generosity include, include Renwin Outkist, Matt, Matt from the North. Lori Hendricks, Pat Mack, Bear Ashby, my dumb movies, karate. Cat Mom, Mo, Lester, Karen, Vaughn, and I got to know all of you owing a debt of gratitude that you just became members of the following, courtesy of Aaron Hack. God bless you, Aaron Hack. The following is not at all a cult type of cult. There's no self-harm, no harming others, no tracksuits that are mandatory. Why is it loading? No squirrel mutilations, no goats, goat sacrifices. I'm getting an error is occurring here. I don't like that at all. Go sacrifices. All right. It's working now. That was weird. No throwing virgins into volcanoes. No self-harm or harming others. In no way is the following a cult type of cult. And I'm not the leader of this very non-culty cult uh, following. It's called the following because we're all about greater unity, community, and personal growth. That's really it. That's really it is. But I'm not the leader. I'm not the leader. I'm a follower, just like you. If you want to register your follower number, well, in that case, you need to go over to goodlogic.locals.com. And while I'm just covering this whole stuff and getting this stuff out of the way here, taking care of that, I will ask you all. The one thing I do ask, I do ask, is this part right here. In case you haven't noticed, over the last... Over the last couple of days, YouTube been at their tithing, taking off some of your members, hacking away at you, hacking away at you. I was at 94.1. Now I'm at 94, 94,050. I did cross the 94,000 threshold. And if people don't continue to resubscribe, hit that subscribe, they just go vanishing. They just go vanishing. It's, and it's, it's sad. It's sad that YouTube seems so desperate to keep people away from me that they're willing to unsubscribe them from me. It's just the reality. So an Aaron Hack member for eight months. God bless you, Aaron. John Jelaine says, if the ship was on course and power went out, wouldn't it have stayed on course? Doubt there are any crazy cross currents at the at the crossing. I don't know enough about ships to answer that. I'm hoping that 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 legal vices is going to pop in here and help explain that. I think I would think the same thing, but there could be cross currents that we don't know about, which would, you know. Uh, true in 1977. 
people let you use slide rules where we use not computers. Design theory has not changed. Gravity and lateral forces have not changed. Right, that's true. But perhaps the levels of redundancy or or efficient redundancy that you were that you were properly citing was lacking here was not nearly as common in during bridge construction in 1977 the way it might be over the last couple of decades. That was my point. Where was Tugboat? Apparently Tugboat had released uh, like a mile and a half earlier, which was not uncommon. I, I brought up a thread which covered that as well during my playback session. Larry Logan, CBS reporter who was assaulted in Egypt. Okay. I don't know much about Larry Logan, but we're going to hear from her now and her unnamed sources saying this was definitely a cyber attack. And was there when that bridge was opened. He knew when he looked at the security camera vid video of the harbor, the long version, the seven minutes, he knew from the start of that video when he looked at that ship that it was not in the channel. You need to be in the channel to make that turn, to have any chance of making that turn. So now you're traveling. That is a river that, that flows pretty quickly, Steve, even under normal circumstances. Right. And at a certain point, you're committed. That ship is heavy. The load is heavy. The, the water is flowing at a certain speed. You've got very little room to maneuver. So at a certain point, there was absolutely nothing that they could do to stop that ship from the course that it was on because they were not in control of it. And they had all of these other factors coming into play. And you're assuming that is because of a cyber attack on their systems that shut down their power. So that implies that there was no nefarious activity by anyone on board the ship, but that they were victims of terrorist activity, according to Lara Logan, if you believe that there was. But that means these terrorists have to realize that this hack that they're doing into the ship, that the currents are going to do enough to actually pull that ship into a pylon. Right? Hands back says, simple answer, cold start ship engine fails, well underway, lose all power and start coasting uncontrollably. Anchor drops on right side. It pulls ship right into the bridge. She sounds like Sidney Powell. She could be. I don't know. She could be a crazy person. So when, when terrorism and counterterrorism experts look at this, when people who know uh, critical infrastructure, um, when, you know, there's a number of different people that I've spoken to, cyber people, when they look at it, they know exactly what they're looking at. And so it's extraordinary that anybody could come out now when they haven't had time to do an investigation, when they, I know for a fact that they're getting people inside their agencies that are telling them what they're telling me, and they're making public statements that completely contradict what anybody who knows this this terrain, who knows it, and I don't just mean the physical terrain, I mean the cyber terrain and uh, and the terrorism terrain and the you know and the critical infrastructure terrain and all of that. I mean, I talk to people whose job. Here's here's the thing. Here's the thing. So now I'm supposed to believe Lara Logan. Who look, I don't know anything about Lara Logan personally. I don't I don't know anything about her credibility or anything of that nature. She may be highly credible. She might be lacking in any credibility whatsoever. I literally know nothing about Lara Logan. I don't know if I've even heard her name more than 24 hours ago. But I'm supposed to basically believe her and her unnamed source that this was definitely cyber terrorism and they're lying to us. It sounds like the sort of thing that someone would want me to believe and help sow division also. I'm very, very suspicious here. I, if you named a source, that would mean a lot. It would mean a lot. If she's not willing to name a source, which it doesn't seem like she's going to be naming a source, then it's basically I have to believe Lara Logan, who's not even a first. She's not even a first. She's not a source herself. If you at least put a name to it, then we could vet that person's credibility. There, how would they know this information? It's very bothersome to me. The lack of the naming is really, really bothersome to me. Mary Coppola says, you haven't sh shut down I-95 down once. They removed the debris boats. We'll be able to pass through the port and we'll use the harbor tunnels and trains. I saw the bridge being built growing up in Baltimore. And I know you guys in Baltimore call it Baltimore. Baltimore, not Baltimore. Baltimore. Um, bridge isn't nearly as old as Chesapeake Bay Bridge. That's probably true. That's possibly that's probably true. Bella Stella hit me. What a pity. What a pity. God bless you, Bella Stella. Thank you. Thank you for your awesome support. 
Kate says, how do I access the free membership? I'll be an excellent soldier in this call to have my tracksuit ready, tinfoil, and cool it. No, there's no tinfoil. Okay, no, that, I'm not even joking. There's no tinfoil. I have no patience for the tinfoil, okay? There's no tinfoil. There's really no tinfoil. I'm a lot cooler with goat sacrifices and squirrel mutilations than I am with tinfoil, okay? I, I No tinfoil. Seriously. Seriously. I re, I genuinely reject tin, I don't think tinfoil. I think tinfoil should be illegal, okay? No, I reject tinfoil. 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 Even when I'm talking Lady Logic, and I'm like, hey, I got this leftover guac. What should I do with it? And she's like, oh, leave it in a bowl and throw some tinfoil. I'm like, no, no, I need Tupperware. No tinfoil, okay? No tinfoil. If you need a, if you need the membership, what I urge you to do is hit me up on, um, on Twitter. I see those quickest, at the following pro, at, like as in the following program. So one word, the following pro. There's not enough letters that can let me put the gram in there. So I'm shorter, Graham. But it's the following pro, at the following pro. And my my DMs are open. Hit me up, make a request, and I'm happy to take care of you. Step one, shutting down DC. Oh, look, I, I, look, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay, 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 okay. I need to do this. 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 First, the first thing I need to do before I go any further here, before I go any further, is I need to bring in this this sagacious individual, this sagacious individual here, by the name of Legal Vice. Hello, how, how you doing? Are you, how are you, my brother? Now, those of you oh, who good. are not familiar with Legal Vices, I will tell you this: a, you damn well ah. should be. Ah. The dude is not just based and a brilliant attorney who happens to be spending the last several decades on the wrong <laughs> side of the Pacific. But he happens to also have, have has his level of expertise in the law is focused on maritime law, which means that this yeah. is a guy who actually knows about the sea. So he doesn't just look like the old man, but he's yeah. seriously <laughs> and he's, the sea. Yeah. He's he's the old man and the sea. And that's why when he came out here, one of the things he said to me, in fact, he popped in here. With his with his saying, there's this is in no way terrorism. Ah. Rule it out, Joe. Just rule it out. There's no chance whatsoever that it was terrorism. Sometimes I do know things. Tell Hang me on. how it is. How do you know? Because I I basically said I don't know, and I'm willing to admit I don't know. And I'm listening, Lara Logan, and she's not doing a great job convincing me because she won't name sources, and she just basically says her intel tells her that this was yeah. a cyber attack. What she says is cyber attack on the on the power systems of the ship designed to get it to crash into the pylon and basically take down the bridge for the purposes of crippling our ability to engage in transportation and and of our hazardous materials. And Legal Vices here says, no, that's not reality. The, so tell, tell just, me how you know the, for sure. She, I, 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 don't, I don't trust much of what she said because she won't name sources, yeah. but tell me how you know definitively that she's wrong. First of all, she's she's crazy. Um, but again, that's not empirical. Uh, she look the the physics involved, the absolute perfect timing you would have to 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 do to arrange the exact angle at the perfect time with the just from a physics problem. It's it would be utterly in, inconceivable that you could possibly launch an attack that would 100% guaranteed knock out the engines at just that time, at just that speed, at just that location to account for wind, current, tides, speed and direction of vessel to get it to hit that pylon. I mean, that, that just boggles the mind. And first of all, there are redundancies built into these things. Uh, but when you get a total blackout, which isn't an unheard of event on a ship, but normally they happen out in the middle of the ocean where you go, ah, crap, we've just lost all power. All right, let's find out what the problem is. Let's get it running again. And there's no problem. But right. having, having a complete and utter blackout in the middle of a river approaching a bridge, it, that would be a captain's absolute, most horrifically conceivable nightmare. 
and it, it's it's also I mean it's under the pilotage of, of two local pilots who are experts. Uh, the the vessel is regularly inspected, and it's it's not like it, it's not like so you can just regularly... hack into their computer system and drive it into a bridge. I'm gonna play I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna play, let me play devil's advocate. Yeah. So a a I'm what I'm understanding you to basically say is when you're considering for the wind and the tide and the currents and the weight of the ship and the distance from the pier and the accuracy yeah. with when you're shutting everything down, that basically this is like putting on a blindfold, blindfold and trying to hit, you know taking out a bow and trying to hit a target from a hundred yards away. That it's like it just seems crazy to think that someone's able to make that shot. I mean, I mean, is that a fair way of assessing? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, if you look at the track that, and I wish I could bring it up, but I'm on my stupid tablet, and you can't share Windows on stupid tablets. Uh, if you look at the track the ship was on, it was on a perfectly normal, perfectly straight course to go directly under the bridge where it should have gone until five minutes before when the power outage occurred. And at that point, it immediately starts to veer off course, which you would expect. There's a 13 knot wind, which is what about 16, 17 miles an hour. Uh, you've got a current that it was going out towards low tide. So the current is going out towards the sea. You've got the current running out towards the sea. You would expect it to catch the, this, this ship is so massive, Joe. People aren't really understanding the size of this ship. It's uh, it's ninety five thousand tons to begin with. Uh, uh, the that's unloaded, right? And it's a thousand feet long. It's three hundred meters. It is three football okay. fields but end I, but to I, end. So, but I do want well, to, no, I, want, I do want to push back. But I'll finish your, your well, thought and then and yeah, then hang, hang on, Rick. So, so this thing is a thousand feet long, three football fields end to end, and it's almost exactly one football field wide. Mm -hmm. So this is an enormous ship. It's loaded with ten thousand containers. Is this the YouTube video you're talking about here that I pulled up? Um, this is showing this guy. Yeah, that's actually, a, this guy that's is sharing, not a chart here. The time and the he's sharing basically, and you can see here in the green is he's sharing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll this along, but basically, he he follows from the beginning where he he basically. I'll I'll, I'll sort of roll this with him. Yeah, on okay. The, yeah. The, the, see, this here like, shows you how it, it comes out from the pier. It does the U-turn, and the white line is sort of the ship highway. That's the mm -hmm. shipping lane. That's the fairway, they call them. That's where the ship normally goes. And it's perfectly normally right exactly where it should be until the power goes out. And notice how when he's showing it here, he's showing how it's on the left side. It's on the left side as it's moving along here. I'm playing this in double yeah. speed when he played it. He was playing it set up also. But basically, this is this white section here is the shipping lane. And it's on the yes. left side of the shipping lane. Um when when suddenly when the power goes out and he, he, he moves it along until it gets to um the vicinity of the bridge and yeah. and he, he's narrating all this and this over here is where the hand that's is the bridge. that's the bridge that's the bridge itself and you can see it's right where it should be at this point yeah. in time and he says that basically this is the point in time it's around here when it loses power yeah five minutes before roughly five minutes before the collision it loses power and what I want, what I was, what I was getting at is, like, this three football fields long, one football field wide. It's loaded with ten thousand containers. This thing is, you know, 10, 15, 20 stories tall. It is a giant. Go out. And, we've all, we've all tried to unload a, a sheet of plywood or something and move it in a windstorm, and you get blown around. Yeah. Imagine a plywood, a piece of plywood, twenty stories tall and a thousand feet long. It, it's being pushed along by a wind. It's being pushed along by current. It's going to go off course when you lose power and you lose your steering ability, which is and there's, what there's another there's another factor in this equation which we haven't even addressed, which is one thing that these terrorists, if it were a terrorist attack, would have to try to account for is yeah. the nature of the stacking of the cargo is going to have a significant impact on how the ship would be affected by wind. Meaning yeah. crosswinds, if it's stacked exactly. up higher and thicker versus lower, the level of impact that the wind would have on this ship exactly. would, would be far more or less significant 
depending on the nature of how the, the cargo ship itself was stacked. So they would have to be able to calculate for that as well. And as you see, and the wind speed here, itself. How and, are yeah, they going to and the wind, the wind speed, and the wind also can variate depending on whether you're talking that you're half a mile from the bridge or closer to more in the open to, uh, to you know closer to the bridge. It can be it can be a variant that's changing constantly throughout this throughout yes. the balance of the time after you turn the power off. So that, and I think that I think that's an important point as well. So, and this is where he identifies that it that it loses its. I think this is where he, is the key bridge right here. And this is where I want to kind of get this coincided with what's going on. All right, on the left is marine traffic. On the right is the live feed that we have from the Port of Baltimore. Okay, I tried to sync this up the best I could. The video is not this running a exactly slower. the same moment. But this is the moment that we see Dolly lose power. She goes dark in the video up here. She is out without power at this time. You see the vessel is progressing right here at about 8.5 knots. It looks much closer to the bridge than it actually is. It looks like it's like 10 feet away from the bridge, but that's the depth. Perception. It's not far. Yeah, but I think it's I think it's probably several hundred meters. It just doesn't look like that. Because but again, see, but see, when you say it's several hundred meters, remember the ship itself is it's several hundred meters. Hundred meters. Yeah. That's so true. it's basically like you, you lose power. You know, four or five car lengths or two or three car lengths in front of the car in front of you. But if we look on the, sh if we look on the, if we look, assuming this is to scale the, the image on the video, yeah. the green ship looks like it's three ship lengths away from the bridge at this point, at least. So, yeah. so um, as if he did it accurately and if it's to scale, which we don't know that it is. But. And being on the water is a lot like being on ice. So imagine you hit a patch of black ice, three car lengths from the car in front of you. You skid, you slide, and there's not a damn thing you can do to stop before you hit the car in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's essentially what you're looking at. So, the, and you can see at this he's identifying how it starts and now again, to veer towards the right. One of the things right. that we're not sure about here is what is causing as soon as the power, power comes outage off. on the vessel. Yeah. Uh, is it mechanical? Is it computer? Is it fuel? <laughs> we just don't know. But the ship goes completely dark. And let me be clear: the worst feeling ever on a ship is to lose power. Everything gets quiet. S silence is the enemy on a ship. That means everything has gone wrong. So here we see the vessel coming out. It had just come from the secret terminal, which you can see right behind it. Uh, secret. She was actually up on this berth right over here. And if you watch the on the right, are. you can see yeah. the ship's about uh, to make like a turn. The center part it looks the like they actually turned the uh, rudder. She's coming down. So yeah, she's it's, progressing. But you down. have to look at I mean, This is at an angle. We're looking at this from an angle, so it yeah. looks like it's going across the bridge, but it's actually coming in a straight line under the bridge, yeah. as you can see from the, the, the chart on the left. And that, that's part of what makes this so confusing for those of us who are not familiar with yeah. seeing this type of thing and why this is such a deceptive visual angle. Knots at this point. And she is coming down the channel. Now, I got this playing at basically real time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and speed it up here in a minute. But I want to get to the point where she will get this is literally the worst nightmare for a, a captain of the ship. We'll see the lights come back on. And with the by bus. the way, now. At this moment, there's Miraculous. a big question about whether or not the ship has rudder control. This is the key thing. If the ship does not have rudder control... So just can you explain what rudder control is specifically? That's your steering. That's just steering. Yeah, it's, okay. the, it's the steering. You, you control, you control the, the rudder. Back, which, in the back of the boat? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. You, you, it's, it's, it loses its steering. Okay. So Then the ship is careening out of control. There's nothing you can do. Uh, the ship would have an anchor ready to drop. You would have a crew up on the bow. But the question is, is that crew still there? Are they standing by? They should be in place until they get out past the bridge and the channel. There is a Maryland Bay pilot on board advising the ship's master. Right at this moment, hopefully, they're calling out uh, issues on Channel 16 and the other hailing channels that they'll be using. Which apparently they did, which saved a lot of, probably saved a lot of lives. They sent it out probably saved, it probably Mayday saved signal. Dozens. Yeah, that Mayday signal I, I said at the beginning at the top of this show. Miraculously, it's miraculous how quick the acting and thinking was of both the people on the ship and on land. Yeah, oh, they, convey... they, they train regularly for these situations. When something like this happens, they go into autopilot mode and just start doing their job. Yeah. And luckily, this was a toll bridge, so they can send the signal to put all the signs up, flash up the signs that the bridge is closed and shut it down instantly rather than dispatch officers with cones and flares to wave people off. So yeah. they were able to shut it down instantly, which is a good thing. 
Yeah, no, this was um, this was miraculous that there weren't dozens, if not hundreds, of people who could have been killed on this thing. Ship's radio here. You see the power come back on the vessel. So now uh, Dolly has power back on. She is starting to drift. If you look at uh, marine traffic here, she is starting to drift toward. If you're looking the, over on the uh, south side of the channel at this point, so she's uh -huh. beginning her movement. The... Remember, this is a vessel in the green that image is joined... about a hundred thousand tons. So the a substantial the size vessel. It will have. A now, lot of I want some people to pause for just a quick, quick second. Now the light came, the lights just came back on, so apparently they got they got the engine, they got the power back on, pr presumably the generators. This isn't like your car starting where you go zzz, 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 vroom, and starts right up. You have to go through so many layers of generator starting and so many. It it takes a long time to restart a ship's engine. And but if the engine they is have cold, rudder control to turn it back toward the left no, at this point, no. Uh, well, the, once the once the, the power comes on, they may because. Mm -hmm. But again, you're talking. And see, that's, that's what I, I wanted to emphasize is that I, I just ran some numbers and you, the, the vessel is about 95,000 tons. Uh, it has 10,000 containers on it. Each container weighs about two tons empty. So that's 20,000 tons worth of containers. Inside the containers, they can be anywhere from empty to 10 or 20 tons. So if you just say there's two tons of cargo in each container, another 20,000 tons. The fuel, this thing carries 2.2 million gallons of fuel. That's 8,300 tons of fuel. If you do all this math, at, at lightest, this ship was around 350. Million pounds. It was around 143 million tons that slammed into this bridge. And so when you when you're trying to move a 300 million pound object that's traveling at 10 miles an hour, it takes a long time. You can turn the rudder immediately to you know hard starboard or hard port, but it's going to take a very long time and a very long distance for those changes to take effect. Right. And each ship has what's called a turning circle on the bridge, which calculates the time it takes a ship to make a complete 360 degree turn. It can take 30 to 45 minutes for one of these big ships to make a complete circle. So it, it takes... You know, it would take at least you know 100 200 yards for this ship to even begin to even slightly have any of these changes in rudder take effect but that's what makes it okay so just to play devil's advocate for me who's yeah. a lay person and many of the audience may be a lay person that's what makes it seem so mind-boggling that it was able to have such a dramatic shift being, with the power being off for only 60 seconds i'm sorry i meant 315 million pounds sorry Right. <laughs> that's okay Sorry, that's okay yeah. but the point the point Sorry. that i'm making the, po the point i'm making though is doesn't that make it sound that much less likely that it would turn to the right the way it did just by simp by because of current once the ship turns off seeing as how it's so difficult to move something that heavy it's it's completely at the mercy of, of the you said there was a 13 knot crosswind which is you know, Right around 15, 16 miles an hour, somewhere around there, we'll call it. So, so the crosswind's coming from north to south? Yes. Uh -huh. So it's coming down. And that's also the direction that the current is going and also the direction that the tide is going. So it's going to be catching the current, the tide is going to be pulling on it, and the wind is going to be pushing it in that direction. So that's why it starts to veer off that direction. And with that in mind, you can understand why even turning the rudder was going to have a slower impact yeah. on, on, on fixing course rather than taking it off course. I, 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 I looked at my numbers again. I did lawyer math. It's uh, 143,000 tons and three, 315 million pounds. That's what I meant to say. So chat, ease the hell up. It's lawyer math. And the rudder would not be answering. So yes. wherever that rudder was, even if the rudder was dead center, it's not providing any maneuverability because you have torque from the propeller. The propeller is going to want to twist the ship. Now we're seeing smoke belching out of the, the ship. Here's the smoke coming out. What we tend to think is this is the ship starting to back down. Uh, they will try to get way off the ship. And that's going to be an indication we're going to see here if the ship begins to slow down. 
So I got it running now. It's a little bit off sync. Uh, it's just not quite uh, chime, uh, timed in. Exactly. You can see it's like almost turning right towards the, the camera. But what you do see is yeah. the shoot is starting to lose way. It's starting to come off. It's down to 7.6 knots. Now the ship is coming out of the channel at this point. And still this has is the perfect narration on that could be just a little bit of loss there by maneuverability. We know she drops her port anchor. We just don't know when she drops the port anchor. Okay, I didn't know the they port dropped anchor, the anchor. The port, the port anchor is is on is it's on the left side of the ship, yeah. which would be to our right. Right. So, so in other words, that you would think would pull it back toward the the gap, right? And I, I'm it 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 would start to slow the ship and the back end would would swing so around so towards right. our left it would yeah. list out it would list out yeah. towards the uh towards but i'm surprised they got the i didn't hear they had the anchor down i mean i'm surprised because it takes a lot to manually drop an anchor there's a lot of mechanical things you've got to do so these these, these this crew is amazing if they got one of the anchors dropped as well and again, more black smoke coming out of the vessel. This is either an engine failure or the, the issue of the ship trying to uh, back down. And then you have the strike. I heard that. I read that that could have been the diesel engine starting up. The, the back well, yeah, all, the ships battery. run on diesel. No, the, 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 all ships run on diesel fuel. Right, well, there's, that, a few LP, there's a few LPG ships, but what that is, I mean, is what he was saying, I completely agree. It was them reversing engines and trying to slow this ship down as much as possible. Mm -hmm. so that that's what it would indicate to me that they they threw this thing into reverse basically like up against the bridge that's where you see the speed come off to about 1.5 knots there and on the video you will see the ship there'll be a big splash in front of the vessel as it hits that piling and you'll see the uh uh, uh collapse of the pier you're still I mean, seeing the force that that must have hit yeah. 315 million pounds smashing into that at uh you know 14 15 miles an hour that's uh, and when we see the collapse which we're about to see in a moment I i'll tell you right now i i would speculate that most of the people the, the construction workers around the ship probably died on impact it's like it's, it, i mean they're falling 200 feet here from the yeah. vessel at this point uh, the ship has basically come now to a full stop at this point. With wreckage falling all around its you. maneuverability. It's yeah. still a little bit away on because of the GPS. Uh, it just takes a while for AIS and GPS to get in sync with that. And this is the moment of impact that we will see here uh, about 1.28 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, four-hour difference between UTC See a big splash there as the pylons hit, and then you oh. have the, the bridge collapse. So that gives you a kind of a play-by-play -play there on marine traffic as it goes on. Anyhow. Yeah. So, so I mean, to, to get it to do what she's saying, you, it just physics and just the absolute master of weather, time, and space you would have to be to pull off a cyber attack to do that is utterly, it's just laughable on its face. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, how, how would you even begin to do that? To calculate for wind, speed, weight, container size, container height, current, tides, and launch a cyber attack at exactly that second. It would bring all of these random forces of nature into play to drive you right into that one particular pylon. In the world, accidents happen. What if this was like the 20th time that a ship lost power there? Well, then it's a Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. No, what I'm saying <laughs> is, what if this wasn't the first time yeah. that terrorists tried to 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 do this to a ship? And this, but this is the first time we learned about it because it was successful in in their efforts. I'm just trying to find some basis to give justification. To there's, the there's no basis to find any justification whatsoever. I'm, for this. I, I look, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I'm not, I, I, you know, you, 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 ha, you make a very yeah. compelling counterpoint here. And like I said, for lack of sources from the get go, I mean, just being like, uh, I don't know. Well, it's, it's easy to spout off. Ah, it was a cyber attack, but explain to me what a cyber attack is. Explain to me how it would affect the ship systems. And nobody can give you that answer. I mean, I, you would think that they could hack on hack in through computer into like if someone could hack in through computer to their electrical systems and shut it down, that that's 
And again, I'm not saying I believe that's what happened. Like I said, you have me, you have me pretty much believing that it's impossible for this to happen. I'm just it's trying impossible. to play devil's advocate here. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate yeah. here. So, um, I mean, if you said a crew member and it was an all Indian crew, um, if you said that there was some sort of you know Islamic terrorist or Russian terrorist at the helm that you know went rogue and slammed the ship into the bridge, that would be far more believable than rigging a cyber attack. Yeah. I, <laughs> And each of these ships has what is essentially a black box. It's, it's, a, it's a VDR. It's a voyage data recorder. It does the right. exact same, same thing that an airplane uh, black box does. And as soon as an accident happens, they shut that thing down and they lock it. Because it's not like a, it's, it's a 12 or a 24-hour playback loop. So it starts recording over itself after a while. Mm -hmm. And so they lock that down. And the only people that can touch that are the technicians dispatched by the manufacturer of that black box. They'll come and manually remove it and download the data. Right. And all of, all of that data will say exactly what happened on that ship. Every alarm, every... You know, every change in speed, course, uh, you know, the, the heading, the, the, it'll have the wind speed, it'll have the direction and bearing of every other vessel in the neighborhood. It'll, I mean, it, it, it records every single mechanical in digital thing on that ship. So me, it, it would be ask, easily known. Let me ask you this. I am curious, and I don't want to keep you long because I know you have to go do work for you where you it's are. It's lunchtime. I'm okay. fat and hungry. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let you go in just a minute. I just had a couple of questions, and that was yeah. um, they say they're gonna begin their invest. They expect to begin their investigation yeah. tomorrow. How long should we anticipate it will take before we will get an initial preliminary report as to the, Ooh, the preliminary reports are, are a tricky thing. It could be weeks, probably more like months. Really? It is going to be investigated by a bunch of people. The National Transportation Safety Board is going to be investigating. They're the Coast Guard is going to be investigating. Yeah, yeah the uh, Army Corps of Engineers is going to be looking at the structure of the bridge. It was a Singaporean vessel, so the Singapore, uh, they're, they're, they're equivalent of the uh, Coast Guard and Port Authority, are going to be coming and doing their own investigation of the ship and the bridge collapse. There's going to be multiple agencies involved in this. And uh, I, I think the first, probably from the U.S. side, the first one you're going to see is probably going to be from the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. I, I would imagine the well, NTSB, NTSB, the NTSB claims that they have jurisdiction because they say that when there's a when there's an incident that involves more um, just than just waterways, yeah. then it falls to the Coast Guard. But if it involves a second form of transportation, then it falls to their jurisdiction. So since this is involving a, a, a car a car bridge. It's something mm -hmm. that they have, they claim jurisdiction on over the Coast Guard, at least according to their. Yeah, they'll, the, they'll both be doing the investigations, though. Okay. They'll, they'll, they'll both investigate it. But you're saying we're really going to be in the dark on this probably for, you know, well into April. Yeah, I, I would guess. At least. I mean, there might be some initial indications as to what caused the power failure on the ship. Right. But it's to get into all of the what everybody was doing at every moment and what steps were taken to avoid the accident, what mitigating factors there were, how it hit the bridge, the angle it hit the bridge, and the, you know, how it caused the collapse is going to take months. A final report could take years, you know, a year or two to get the final actual report. Because they're going to hold hearings and all these other you know, procedural things. All right. Let me, um, let, me, let me run through. I'm going to just quickly glance through Super Chats that might relate to you. And, okay. And just pull them up, and then I'm going to let you run it. I thank you so much for popping in here unexpectedly, and just no uh, and just providing a wealth of insight and perspective. I've just gotten so sick of ev everything that happens in the world is a conspiracy of some sort. It, 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 it isn't you know, it demeans and it, it weakens it. I mean, see if, if you're going to get in the conspiracy theory, look at the conspiracy theory of conspiracy theories. They're doing yeah. that to desensitize us, to make us believe it. So when a real one does happen, we discount it as a, as a conspiracy theory. I agree. For this is why this is why I had massive problems with QAnon, the whole cracking and trust the plan. I'm like, you you're not helping. You're making things much worse. Yeah. Because yeah. you just when you're full of crap, you're just now you become the boy who cried wolf. And no exactly. one's ever. Exactly. Um. So Joe Sullivan said, "Wow, this woman is so full of it. She's playing up the terrorism angle. It's not conspiracy. It's just incompetence. It's also pronounced Baltimore." I, I got that right. <laughs> it's not even really incompetent. Some, some of the things just happen. So Q Revere was saying people insisting absolutely must be terror are just as annoying as the ones insisting absolutely must be an accident. But you at least mm -hmm. have justification. You, you know, so he, he said this yeah. he said this a half hour ago before you even popped on here. Yeah. 
You have you have uh, that where you're coming from. So Kira Revere watched my three hour show yesterday, so he knows all of my thoughts on it. He, yeah. he saw my my anti anti uh, conspiracy theory rant that I went on yesterday. Derna eighteen oh four says, "I've personally met Lara Logan. I can assure you, she's crazy. She's histrionic. Imagine Amber Heard, but fifty IQ points lower. Terrifying." Okay. <laughs> um, Mr. Shaw saying, "Yeah, my two best boys on at once." <laughs> there you go. Pam says, "Thank you, Legal Vices, for mentioning physics." Uh, Cars and death. I can't says, do them. I just know that they happen. <laughs> Cars and death says terrorists would have done it in rush hour, which I think is a, is a good point too. Uh, I gotta know wants to know what was on the ship. I think we, we, we just know it's cargo. We don't know what kind of cargo. Yeah, car- the, I mean, it's cargo bound for all over places all over the world. It could be anything. That the ultimate destination was Sri Lanka, uh, but you would stop other places in between. It could. We just don't know. It could be anything from paper to tin cans to cars, and, and literally anything can be on that ship. Yeah. Griff says, I grew, up, I grew up in Walmart, first job at Bethlehem Steel at the foot of, the, of this bridge. This is going to devastate Maryland economy, if not oh, all yeah. the U.S. Yeah, that's certainly true. Most of our infrastructure is decades past replacement. I doubt it was terror, but possibly on purpose, maybe, done to hide how nearly all big bridges across America are past the point of no return. It seems it doesn't it doesn't seem like it based on on how things played out. That channel is crazy in ideal weather. So he's he's talking about what you know the the currents there. Mm-hmm. Baltimore Harbor pilots know their crap. I think you were talking about your channel, Joe. Yeah, your channel is <laughs> crazy regardless. Even of the in weather. ideal weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Amy says ball hashtag Baltimore strong. Mo Lester says, "We're trying to train fish to drag it, to, dra- to drag it, Mister Smart Guy." <laughs> that that would actually make more sense than Logan's deal. <laughs> if just says BS, then it's BS. Acquit it, chat. There you go. Army Mom oh, says, oh, "Yeah, no." <laughs> Why is Biden offering taxpayer money for damaged bridges? Isn't the shipping company insurance responsible for damages? That's an interesting question. Who would be responsible for damages? Uh, well, the. The, the 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 insurer. Um, that's something I'm, I'm looking into. We'll, I'll be talking about it on my Maritime Monday show on Monday to see what information I can find out about. That. I know the insurance is a Britannia Protection and Indemnity Club. They're one of the largest ship insurers on planet Earth. Yeah. So I mean, they're well insured, but we have this little thing called limitation of liability, where the the ship owners get to limit their liability to pennies on the dollar in most cases. Well, wow. we'll it's a thing. We'll talk about it on Monday. Yeah, make sure you, ch- you guys check that out. And I'm gonna put, I'm gonna tag legal advice. It's not in the description yet, but I'm gonna add him shortly as soon as he gets on out of here. Someone taking remote control of the ship and being able to make it do what they want without being there on the water at that moment is laughable. It's and, beyond laughable. And this I got. Stone Struggle says, if we find out that it's captain's first run, to also find out the captain is a DEI hire. Remember that DIE hire. Remember that female captain crashing the vessel a couple of years ago, blocking the Panama Canal. I don't remember. No, that. They, 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 they don't. Your your first run as a captain is not on a ninety five thousand ton, thousand foot long, one of the largest container carriers on planet Earth ships, and they, they're all highly qualified Indian crew members. There's minimum safe manning requirements. There's training that has to go into it. Yeah, this these are the two guys who were supposedly running the ship. Um, they were, they don't have we don't have their names yet, but um, this the, the this this one who's the motorman oiler is he supposedly had experience on container ship, and the one who was the master the master is the one who's real is like the captain. He's the right? captain. Yeah, so that, that's it. I I I had read that they were an all Ukrainian crew. I is, is what. Uh... Is what I'd heard. So but he was from Ukraine. The, the master. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, all Indian crew. The, the there was master all that was from crew. Ukraine, and the rest, I believe, were from India. Okay, that, that's yeah. not unusual. Really? Is it Ru- Russian and Ukrainian masters, first officers, and the rest of crewmen from India or the Philippines? Is is quite common. All right. Well, I want to thank you. So let me make sure I didn't miss any rants over here while I'm before I let you go. Because I think I got them all. So that's um, interesting. That that's the first I'd seen that the uh, the master was was uh, Ukrainian and not Indian. Because the, everything I saw before was that the entire crew was Indian. So eh, there you go. Yeah. That, that, see, this this is the thing. This this happened less. I mean, almost what twenty two hours ago. It's everything is still so fluid. Information is still still trickling out because they've just barely stopped looking for the bodies. Yeah, it's true. And there's. It, 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 to anybody that says they really, including myself, that says they really know anything about the the intricate facts of what happened, 
is wrong. We're just speculating just based on what we can see and what experience tells us. The, all the information is going to come out one way or the other. Hands One Pack has a question, a rant asking, okay. without full power, do they also lose any, any bow, uh, bow thrusters? Yeah. If, 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 if it's a total blackout, you're sitting there very quietly in the dark. No. Nothing. But you, if, if you have the generators, emergency generators on, then you, you depends on what systems you can, you can operate. But if it's a total blackout like that, you're just done. He also points out the ship's a thousand feet long, probably 200 feet tall. So big ass sail with crosswind. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to let you. I'm gonna, I have other chats here that I'm going to get to, but they're, they're All right. uh, as relevant well to you. I thank you for joining me, my brother. You are awesome. And I Don't believe the insanity, soon. Joe. Stop the <laughs> insanity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate you coming in here and setting saying it straight. Last last two questions here. Aren't they required to use a harbor pilot when bringing in a ship of that size to U.S. port? They, they had they two pilots. Out. Yeah, they were, they were going up, but they still in. had they still had one pilot. I've heard two pilots as well on board. My question is, why were there no Jews on the ship, Joe? <laughs> they all know not to be on the ship. I read that the ship was excluded from a port in Chile <laughs> nine months ago for for propulsion issues. Is that true? Have you heard anything about that? No, I don't know. I have no oh, idea. Mr. It K. was involved in an accident in 2016 where it kind of ground off the edge of a pier, but different captain, oh. different circumstances. This ship would have to be, is, is not, they, they, I mean, how do they check the integrity of this ship to ensure that it's still safe for travel? What do they do when you have a situation? Oh, like God. The, they, have, they, they have what's called classification societies. They, they, get, they crawl over every inch of that ship. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they make a big, long checklist of before this ship sails anywhere. You got to do this, 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 and it, this is this ship is not going anywhere for a very long time. Mister K is asking why is such a dramatic difference in two pilot salaries? One was twelve hundred, and the other was ten thousand two hundred per month, and that is that is correct. Uh, the the difference there, well, one is sixteen hundred, and the other was ten thousand two hundred. Yeah, one's a captain, and the other is a, is a motorman oiler. There's there's probably a big difference, yeah. and plus. Plus, you know, one's Ukrainian, and we have to give Ukrainians as much money as oh, we so, can. Well, so were the, those, was that the crew? The, the pilots are the people they, they come on board to guide the ship out. This, he's so, referring to these two people over here, that this guy up here, oh, okay. Motorman Oiler, so, was only making 1600 per month, and this guy was making yeah, 10000 the, the Motorman Oiler, I mean, he's like, he's, he's the grunt in the engine room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the captain is the captain. The pilots, the guys that take these ships in and out, they make an absolute F ton of money. They often, you know, they can work on one week on, one week off deals, and they can make three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. Hmm. When, when, I, when I deal with pilots, even here in, in Korea, they'll, they work two, three days a week, make a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand a year. I, I, I mean, take home. I, I, all right, I'm throwing you. I'm throwing you out of here. I'm, in the, I'm the yeah, captain I'm in the of this ship. Of I'm the captain of this ship. Say it. Say it. I'm the captain now. I'm the captain of this ship. Yeah, and I'm in all the right. wrong line of business. I need to be a pilot. Thank Take you, care, my brother. Thank you so much for popping in here. I appreciate you. Have a good night. Bye. Ciao. So that was my good friend Jeff Legal Vices. I am going to put him in the description before I forget. Um, so. I urge you guys to check out his work, especially if you're interested in this calamity, because um, he is he knows more about this than anyone else in this space that I know that I've ever met. So joined by legal places. Right, save that. OK. Um, there were a few other chats I wanted to get to before I start getting into my Trump work, and I don't even know if I'm going to make it to Tulsi, but we'll see. I'm going to be going. I'm going to be running long tonight. This, uh, this is going to be running long. I did not spend near, expect to spend. I didn't even start Rona McDonald, Rona McDaniel. None of this stuff that I plan on covering. Nothing that I have in my thumbnail have I begun to cover yet. So, I'm already an hour twenty minutes into the show. Uh, Hands Pack says, "Why we did blow up Iran centrifuges for enrichment with cyber attack, but I will not jump to conclusions with this with anonymous sources. Uh, yeah, the whole anonymous sources. I'm done with Lara Logan. I'm done with her. You guys have sold me on the fact that she's a crazy person. There were a few chats that that I skipped over, so because they weren't re relevant to, um, um, to to his appearance here. Uh, where are you?" 
So Kimmy Joe asked me this question. Good logic. Can you please explain how saying Christ is king is anti-Semitic? I'm not trying to start anything. I'm just not understanding. So I think that people are basically claiming, and I don't know why it is like over the last couple of weeks, like this whole Jews in the news has become like such a bigger thing that it's just very aggravating to me. And I know you're not asking this in any sort of trolling way. You're genuinely curious about it. I don't really have, I don't really have a problem with it. It's sort of like almost like, I mean, the analogy is basically to the phrase Black Lives Matter. So, it, you know, in the sense that, so this is, I think the purpose is to sort of, with the whole phrase Black Lives Matter, the objective, the objective of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, and getting that as a rallying cry was basically purposefully motivated to create the us and the thems. Are you going to join in and say with us, chant with us, Black Lives Matter. And if you try saying all lives matter or anything else, then you're an opponent who we need to vanquish. So, so that, and that, because otherwise, why are you, why are you saying it? Like, why, why are you making this like a thing to be said? So, so I think similarly, people are taking it as that this, the phrase that now has, is catching fire of, you know, Christ uh, is, is king. So if you believe that, okay, that's fine. Why would you make that like a phrase now that now you're saying this unless your objective is to create similar to Black Lives Matter and us versus them? Are you someone who's willing to go along and, and say that with us? If not, you're otherized and that you're, you know, you're someone who who is an enemy of those of us who are willing to go along with that chance. So I think that's why it's it's being interpreted as being anti-Semitic. I, I made my statement about the whole anti semitism yesterday which i basically my perspective is that it's not at all anti-semitic to say that person is call out a terrible person a jewish person if you call out a jewish person as a terrible person there's nothing anti-semitic about that but if you call out a terrible person as being jewish that's anti-semitic because the whole point is that wh why are you even bringing up their judaism whether it's their dna or whatever whatever element why, why are you bringing that up unless you're trying to say that the fact that they're a terrible person is related to their DNA or as being some part of whatever crazy conspiracy, you know, cabal thing perspective. So that's, that's really, that's why I think it's, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with calling out someone who's Jewish, who is genuinely a terrible person as being a terrible person. I think that's a very moral thing to do. We should be calling out any terrible people who are terrible people for being terrible people. And anyone who tries to say that's anti-Semitic, that's an immoral position to take. The, per the person who's saying that's anti-Semitic, you can't call them out. That their Judaism is a shield from any sort of uh, from any sort of exposure to their terrible nature. I think that that argument is anti-Semitic. You the scream, the chant of that's anti-Semitism when you attack George Soros because he's Jewish. He's not being attacked because he's Jewish. He's being attacked because he's scum. Because he's a terrible human being who's making the world a worse place. The fact that he happens to be Jewish has nothing to do with that. As opposed to someone who says George Soros, the Jew, <laughs> and phrases it that way, that's what makes it anti-Semitic. If you're just calling out George Soros, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You should be. The guy's slime. You call out Harvey Weinstein, you call out Jeffrey Epstein, or any other the Jewish jackasses who are out there, which embarrassingly there are far too many of them. There's not that's that's a moral thing to do. And anyone who says they can't be called out because they're Jewish, that's an immoral position, which hurts Jews. It hurts Jews when people do that. It's shameful for Jews. It's shameful for me. I can't, I'm, I get angry at the Jonathan Greenblatt's of the world who basically try saying that the fact that they have Jewish DNA also now insulates them on some level or another. I mean, F you, you're crazy. You're, you're a liar. That's crap. To say that someone should be shielded because of their DNA or their religion or whatever. And, and, and the way you can actually look at it is, is ask yourself this. And when I when I talk about like I talk about this, I didn't say mention this when I when I threw out that tweet yesterday. But the, if think about it like this: imagine if someone said, you know, George Soros, the Christian, you know, whatever. Bill Gates, the Christian, wants to destroy the world. And then you know, and then every time they just throw in the Christian, the Christian, you'd be like, why the hell are you even mentioning that? How is that relevant to this story? Unless you think that that's somehow relevant. And then I have to ask, why do you think it's relevant? I mean, just think about how retarded that sounds. Klaus Schwab, the, the Christian, wants to dominate the entire world and make us eat bugs. How, how insane is that? That's such a stupid way to phrase it. 
And if you're phrasing it that way, I got to ask, why would you be phrasing it? That's that's insane. And it works the same way in reverse. I think that I think your question, I, I recognize your question for being asked completely in good faith. And I think that's why people sort of take it that way. That it's a way of trying to otherize people who are who um who who are not not believers in, in Jesus. So Shalom, my babies. Joe, why am I getting ads? I don't see any Google execs down in the tunnels with us. Okay, so I want to apologize for this. I see a bunch of you complaining about the ads that you're getting. It's my mistake. It's my mistake. Okay. It's my mistake. When I was setting up this stream, I did it poorly. And I clicked a button that I shouldn't have clicked, and I didn't realize that I see a whole bunch of you are complaining about ads, which I did not expect to happen. And I'm sorry, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Okay? It's not going to happen tomorrow that you're going to be getting these repeated ads. I've seen another it's seven ads in 40 minutes. After the stream is over, I place ads. Okay? That I do do. Because basically that's otherwise YouTube will put in like one ad for the two hours. It's like ridiculous. So I'll do ad placements and I'll try to space them out like, you know, somewhere like around 20 minutes apart from each other. And I try doing that before this stream. Usually I do it after the stream. There's a button I found on YouTube, which enables you to do it before the stream. I did not realize that it would just be hitting you guys in the middle and just be, you know, smacking you up and down with, with ads. And I'm terribly sorry. In fact, I'm going to see if I can fix that right now because I don't want you guys who are watching this while this happens to basically be dealing with this. Can I do that now? Yeah, I just save changes because I don't want to do that to you guys. I, I, I just, I took out and I'm, I'm making a manual. I'm sorry for those of you who had to deal with because I know how annoying that must be. I get it. It's got to be really freaking annoying. So I'm sorry. So yeah, I, I, I don't really have control during the stream as to what happens with that. And I didn't realize that hitting that button would hit people during the live stream. Definitely not. Will there be machine gun turrets in the tunnels? There should be, right? That's definitely like a necessary thing. We definitely, 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 because I think machine guns going to become a thing. Yes, June 2023 during inspection was noted problems with propulsion and mechanics. Oh, thank you for sharing that as well. Uh, a good AI model could predict when to shut the ship down. It could calculate wind and tide and write a script to make the ship do everything we saw. So you're trying to say that it's not that as difficult as they're making it to be. I don't know how the AI model is going to account for the changes in the wind and the tide. Or the, know the weight of the ship. Well, that was helpful. You're very welcome, Kenny Joe. Leave it to the Jew to accidentally monitor. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god, that was great. That was really great. All right. Let me get into Trump. There's a lot to cover in Trump. I don't even know if we're going to do Ron McDaniel, Ron McDaniel. I was going to I was going to show bits of Ron McDaniel. You know what? I'll do a little bit of Ron McDaniel. Only cuz I think this is funny. So, we'll do Ron McDaniel quickly and then I'm going to get into Trump. All right? So NBC sensationally fires ex-RNC chair Ronna McDaniel, second time she's been fired in, in as many months, just days after she was hired in $300,000 per year deal following newsroom mutiny from her woke colleagues. NBC News officially dropped ex-RNC chair Ronna McDaniel as a contributor following backlash from inside the network. They're freaking out. There she is from the RNC. Oh, no. There's an RNC member here. What are we going to do? <laughs> political analyst Chuck Todd slammed his boss on the air and said they owed his colleagues an apology how dare you make me sit in a room with the former chair of the RNC NBC News officially dropped ex-RNC chair Ronna McDaniel as a contributor following backlash from inside the network a statement from the network's chairman confirmed Tuesday evening statement NBC Universal chairman Cesar Conde said after listening to legitimate concerns of many of you I've decided that Ron and McDaniel will now be an NBC News contributor. McDaniel has reportedly been signed to the left-leaning network in a deal that amounted to roughly three hundred thousand a year, according to New York Times. So following the announcement of her hiring, major stars inside the company began a public campaign against her hiring. Morning Joe Horse, Joe Morning Joe hosts Joe. I hate my secretary Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. 
said she would not be invited on their program, and Chuck Todd erupted into an on-air rant, which we watched yesterday, about her hiring, taking particular issue with her support for Donald Trump's false, purportedly false, purportedly false, let's say it properly, his, his exposing the left 2020 election integrity claims. Todd's meltdown was quickly followed by other liberal media stars, MSNBC host Rachel Maddow, basically spitting fire, describing the hiring as inexplicable, said she hoped bosses would reconsider that decision. So when they reconsidered, it's precisely what they did. Conde apologized to the staff who were upset. I'm so sorry. I hurt your feelings. Okay, so fine. All right, fine. So my first question to y'all, my first question to y'all is, are you bothered that she was fired? Are you bothered that she was fired? Because I'll tell you this much. To me, this reminds me of Adam Kinzinger. Like, she's like someone, in her interview there, she was like, look, people who participate in January 6th, they should be punished. They should be punished. Which I was like, eh, eh, eh. Sitting there, kissing up to your stupid $300,000 a year salary, you loser. You stinking loser. You sell out. You soulless vagabond. You soulless political vagabond. You classic neocon. You leftist in red clothing. Gross. Disgusting. So, yeah, that she got fired, I say huzzah. I say huzzah. But I think just like Adam Kinzinger expected, like, no, if I tell you how I don't really, I hate Trump, then you're going to love me on the left. No, they love you for 15 minutes. Then they then they say, oh, sorry, we're removing your seat. Sorry, we're redistricting your seat into non-existence. That's what happens when you want to kiss up to the left. Go kiss up to them, you stupid, stupid hack. You losers. Ronna McDaniel running over to MSNBC. God, God, soulless witch. So, yeah, I, I have no problem with them firing her. I personally I got no problem. To me, it's hilarious that she got fired so quickly. She appeared, made one appearance and she's out. That was great. But I just want to share with you this perspective from Fox, which basically is Ronna McDaniel light. I don't know who this white haired dude is. But he claims to be a friend of Ronald McDaniel, which only tells you, which tells me more than I need to know about him. Basically tells me that he tucks. He tucks tightly. He's basically, he's basically one nice paycheck away from like imitating Dylan Mulvaney. So here's his thoughts about the Ronald McDaniel firing and the media mutiny. About this thing. Well, Ron is a friend, and I did work for NBC, and in November I worked with Caesar and Rebecca and the whole team. I've never seen anything this brutal uh, since I got started in the media in 1990. See, he's been in the media since 1990. I still don't know who he is. That's, that's Hugh Hewitt, I guess, syndicated radio host. I don't know anything about Hugh Hewitt. Maybe you do. But I don't know Hugh Hewitt. I'm sure some of you do. There's, there's 2,200 of you liking, uh, sitting here you haven't liked yet, but you should. You should. 2,200 of you sitting here. That reminds me, I need to hit my little cartoon here remind you to like and subscribe because face it, you're not getting this in many other places. So you really want to risk finding me again? I don't think you do. And 30% of you are not subscribed. So let's remedy that. If you remedy it, I'll grow a beard in. Right now, just go tea. So I can look more like my cartoon. Anyhow... I give you my word. I give you my word. So here he is here weighing in, weighing in about how about MSNBC freaking out and firing him. Firing Rana her. is going to sue everyone who defamed her. What's that? In 1990. Rana is going to sue everyone who defamed her. She's going to sue everyone who defamed her. Oh, she's, oh, man, she going nuclear on them. Oh, yeah. She going medieval on the ass. For breach of contract. For, inten- for defamation, breach of contract. Intentional infliction of mental distress. Intentional infliction of, a, of a mental distress. Okay. They are going to sue for the destruction of her business opportunities that come from being on TV. Destruction of business opportunities that come from being on TV. I think they made a terrible decision. And terrible decision. Allowed the MSNBC. All right. I just want to break down these different. Le- let's hear the rest of this. Because. He finishes with 
he finishes with a flourish like like a classic like like seriously like a figure skater a flourish that a figure skater would envy he bleed to take over their network and the cult has taken over the news division and it's going to hurt the 74 million people who voted for donald trump are not going to watch nbc news the 74 million people who voted for trump are not going to be watching NBC News. It's really MSNBC. And and how many of them were watching it a week ago? How many? How many? Tell us about the millions of the 74 million Trump voters who were watching MSNBC beforehand that you predicting so proudly no longer going to watch. Oh, if I don't have Ronna McDaniel on there, if they fire Ronna McDaniel, I can't watch this other otherwise impartial show. <laughs> oh, I need me some Rana. I need me some Rana. I can't believe they got rid of Rana. How did you get rid of Rana? Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> well, let's go through his legal analysis there and I'll give you my legal counter. Counter. And for the purposes of this exercise, I'm actually going to take the delicious role, the enviable role of MSNBC's attorneys who would salivate at being able to destroy Ronna McDaniel in this action that he's predicting is going to come and that she's going to go nuclear, nuclear, destroying MSNBC. Now, is it possible? Is it possible that there's a buyout clause that they owe her money for? Yeah. Yeah, that's possible. It's also possible that there's a cancellation clause. We don't know. I haven't seen the contract. This do this doofus sure as heck hasn't seen the contract. So you talk about breach of contract. You don't know if there's breach of contract. It could be. Could be his breach of contract. In which case, likely MSNBC will pay off whatever buyout option they have. Maybe they have to pay the full 300000 I don't know. Maybe they have to give her a 30 days notice and termination and that's an annual thing and then they basically have to pay her for the next 30 days. That's possible too. But let's hear about these different these different these different causes of action that Hugh Hewitt, syndicated radio host, is saying that she's going to go nuclear and oh she's going to destroy them. Let's check this out. For breach of contract for intentional infliction of mental distress, they are going. To well, I missed earlier. Sue everyone who sue defamed everyone her for breach of contract who defamed her. So you're suing the people who defamed you for breach of contract. You would sue them for defamation if they defamed you, but you can't really sue them for defamation because all these crit criticisms of her were clearly, clearly opinion, clearly opinion about how she has no credibility, about the fact that she's slimy, about the fact, I mean, it was clearly, clearly opinion, not statements of fact. It would be, you know, we've, we've seen where things that seem like statements of fact have basically been labeled by courts as being opinion. This was Stuff that you're saying that she's you say she's a, some hack for the GOP who who supported Donald Trump, you know, so supported Donald Trump's claims about the election in 2020. What part of that's not true? What part of that is a lie? So you don't have defamation. Saying we hate her is not defamatory. That's a statement of opinion. That's not a defamatory statement. So no, there's no defamation. The breach of contract, you don't know. It depends on how they handle the contract, what's written in the contract. So you don't know about that. What else you got here? Contract for intentional infliction of mental distress. Intentional infliction of mental distress means that she's going to have to show that she's violently ill as a result of this. That's what you have to show. That's the yardstick. Like, I mean, getting medical treatment. Not like, oh, I felt sad. I felt sad. I was embarrassed. No. No, that doesn't work. You actually have to show. You have to show that there's an impact, like a physical impact to you as a result. Like, you know, someone getting PTSD kind of stuff. That's when you get intentional infliction of mental distress. So, yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. She's kind of a little bit loony, so it's possible that she's got that. But if she's been loony her entire life, it's harder to show that this in, that this incident is what was the causal, the causal connection, the causal factor that put her over the edge. I don't know. Intentional affliction of mental distress is a very, 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 very tough cause of action. He thinks she's going nuclear on them. What else you got here? They are going to sue for the destruction of her business opportunities that come from being on TV. Purely speculative damages. There's no way to know how much she would have made. You get no, no judge. No judge ever wants to sign off on that. What she's talking about is prospective business 
she would have to show that as a result of being on TV, I would have had other business opportunities. Really? How much? Hundred dollars? A million dollars? How much? Prove it. Go prove it. Duty burner proof is on you that you would have gotten a single business opportunity. How do you know? You don't know that. That cause of action is a loser. A loser. No judge. I've And I've tried arguing. Trust me. I know this from experience. I tried arguing this, and I've had judges before I even got the trial telling me, counselor, counselor, don't, don't, don't put too many chickens in that basket. Don't put too many eggs in that basket because the prospective losses, mm -mm, no. Unless you can show me a history, a history which now is lost, no. And she doesn't have any history. She never spent any time on TV until 10 minutes ago. So, yeah, that cause of action, nothing. I think they made a terrible decision, and they allowed the MSNBC bleed to take over their network, and the cult has taken over the news division, and it's going to hurt the 74 million. Yeah, okay, so there you go. It's going to hurt the 74 <laughs> all those, All those MB MSNBC watchers, all those Trump voting MSNBC watchers, because we know that I'm sure that all of you, I'm sure, I'm sure there must be countless members of my audience here who voted for Trump and would tune into MSNBC nightly to get the takes of the like of Chuck Todd, the likes of Chuck Todd, Kirsten Gillibrand, and 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 obviously Rachel Maddow. Obviously, they're they're a mainstay of your of source of news for you. I get it. I get it. But now you say, oh, no more Rana. No more Rana. Oh, we're gonna watch this. I don't even know what I'm gonna do. Uh, whew. where am I at here? If a Jewish person puts, <laughs> okay, yeah, that should be called out. That should that person's immoral. They are terribly, terribly. Immoral. Um, where was I? Got YouTube Premium plebs. Stop bitching about ads. There you go. Get yeah, get YouTube Premium, you plebs. This is why I stand in tunnels despite the long hours. Joe listens to the people who has it better than us. Nobody. It's true. It's true. Not that I'm a leader, but I try. I try helping. I try helping where I can. Thank you for the super chat, Mama Four. You see Trump's truth. Rana says Rana is never, never. <laughs> uh, she can she can hang out with Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney. They can form a little club. The eighteen year old that hacked Rockstar Games to get GTA Six video did it using a hotel TV, cell phone, and Amazon Fire Stick while under police protection. Dude, you still need to make the shot, though. You still need to make the shot. Hugh Hewitt may well be your attorney. He's a big-time Rhino neocon attorney as well as being a radio host on the Salem Network and the Never Trumper. Yeah, not surprising. No, not remotely surprising. Always a spot on the view for Rana. That's almost certainly true. Nobody on either side likes Rana. Kind of like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. I, I'm so happy to see... Uh, Hansback says... Hands one pack says Swiss Roman, no midstream ads yet. And I'm so happy. I'm so happy to see. I want these neocons to see that when you jump to the left, no, you're not you're not finding a new lifeline. It's it's Harry Carry. That's what it is. It's Sapuko. Hands one says, I don't know if I can say that. I don't know if YouTube's gonna be mad at me for that. Remember, Fox hired head. Uh, head of DNC Donna Brazil, but NBC cannot handle the host revolting to hiring from the former head of RNC. Typical left canceling. Yep. Yep. Spot on. Spot on. All right, let's get into Trump. I think I covered everything here. I did. Let me check out, make sure I'm good over here. I'm good on locals. I'm good everywhere. All right. I am good everywhere. There's a lot of Trump stuff that I need to cover. Just going to get this out of the way quickly. This first one out of the way quickly. Do I have it here? Where is it? No. No. Yeah. This I couldn't believe. I don't know. I don't know. Just so you should be aware of it, Trump's newest venture is a $60 Bible. 
His Bible sales pitch comes to be confronting a significant financial squeeze with legal fees growing, life bets, a number of criminal cases and lawsuits. Um, if you want to get you a Trump Bible, all right. Apparently, he gets royalties from it. Though he's not selling the Bible, he's getting royalties from purchases, according to a person familiar with the details of the business arrangement. This is this is very on brand for him, though. This is very <laughs> to be realistic. Is anyone surprised by this? I don't think anyone's surprised by it. I don't think anyone's surprised by it. No. I thought you might not know about it, so that's why I brought it to your attention. But now, now, now you know about it. The other thing I wanted to call to your attention is this weird fight that's happened where Trump is going after Laurel Lee. I'm going to get into him being gagged in a moment, but just once again to this. So this weird fight's going on where Trump says MAGA candidate should challenge this Tampa Republican Laura Lee. Apparently, no one can figure out why he's so mad at Laura Lee other than the fact that she initially supported Ron DeSantis. And she's a first-term rep whose district covers parts of Hillsborough, Pasco, and Polk counties in Florida, was the only Republican member of Florida's congressional delegation to just endorse DeSantis for president over Trump last year. When DeSantis dropped out of the race in January and endorsed Trump, Lee followed suit. But Trump doesn't appear to have forgiven the original slight. And he tweeted out there on True Social, any great MAGA Republicans looking to run against Laura Lee in Florida's 15th Congressional District? If so, please step forward. This encouraged this woman to step forward. Laura Loomer. A lot of people told me I should run again. I received over 22 phone calls from Republican officials today telling me to run against Laura Lee. As people know, Representative Laura Lee's district isn't too far away from where I ran for Congress, and I raised $3 million when I ran for when I ran for office there. It's the third time, really, the charm. She twice ran unsuccessful for Congress, once to represent the 21st, Florida's 21st district in 2020, a second time to represent the 11th district. In the first race, she was defeated by Democratic incumbent Representative Lois Frankel. In the general election, the second, Loomer narrowly lost to the GOP primary to incumbent Representative Daniel Webster, whom Trump had endorsed. On Monday, Loomer continued to gauge public sentiment on her potential congressional bill, bid in the 15th district, which includes the northeast suburbs of Tampa. I'm going to go on a limb here. I'm going to tell you this. This might not be popular. This might not be popular with some of y'all. I'm not a big fan of Laura Loomer. I said it. I'm not a big fan of hers. Uh, I I think that she she I think she's constantly running purity tests, and I don't like purity tests. So me personally, I hope she doesn't. I hope she doesn't run. I I I don't think I don't know why Trump is doing this. I don't know why he's he's going so hard. Like like she's the only one who actually you're going to try and primary out any any member of the House who who supported DeSantis or Haley. Look, a lot of them are rhinos and should be removed. I don't know. Anyone supported Haley? Okay, you want to go after them? I'm, I'm down with that. But Laura Loomer, she's just very... She's just all these purity tests. These constant purity tests. But I'm curious what you guys think about that. I have a feeling that that's not going to be such a popular opinion with my crowd. So, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I am curious where you guys stand on Laura Loomer, but yeah, I, she gives me a headache every time I'm listening to her for ten minutes. I get like a headache. She just relentlessly just—it's like a dog barking, like a, one of those small dogs. Are just <laughs> no, no, I don't want to have to cover any sort of congressional hearing where she's out there. I don't. But I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to have a replacing Laura Lee. I'm just going to say, do you want Laura Loomer in Congress? I'm just going to have a yes, no, and. I also don't think she's terribly. I don't think she adds to the conversation a lot of insight. I know I'm putting a target on my head when I say that. 
She might be a nice person. She might have America First values. I don't know. It's just a fun grading. Only if she is replacing. What is it, Laurel? Laurel Lee. I have a feeling you guys are gonna are gonna vote against me on this, and that's okay. I want you to vote your mind and your conscience. I can't explain why it is. I can't explain it. Hand says, "Do you review Alvin Bragg's Trump docket? There are no motions on. Judges hiding all records under seal. That's crazy. I'm about to go into that mo into his decision now. I'm gonna be running a little long tonight." All right, in, in Rumble, because I don't want you guys to feel ignored, put a one in the chat if you want to see Laura, if you want to see Loomer in Congress, and put a two if you do not. I'm curious where you guys stand on that also. So one if you want to see Loomer in Congress, two if you do not. Debbie o says, I hope Laura Lee thing isn't related to DeSantis. I'm mad at Lee because she voted for the appropriations bill last Friday, 1.2 trillion SMH. Yeah. She also says, Loomer's big mouth, I'm not a fan, but isn't she also suing Ron Coleman? Is she? Is she? I don't remember. If Loomer got into Congress and you stop covering congressional hearings, does it mean you'll finally have time to play Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. So mostly twos. Most of you don't want it. I see one for the entertainment. A handful of ones, but I would say it's like probably 60-30 against. And that was lawyer. 65-30. I would say it's two-thirds, one-third, if not more. It might even be three-quarters against her in Congress. And look at that. Most of you are saying no over here also. Wow, consistency. Consistency across the board. All right. Really gives me a headache. Anyway, Trump got some people upset with the fact that he asked for someone to, to run up against him. Thomas Massey is mad at Trump. House Republicans openly criticizing former President Trump for urging a primary challenger to step up against GOP lawmaker Representative Thomas Massey accused Trump of bullying his colleague, Rep. Laurel Lee, in a post on X, formerly Twitter, on Monday. This is unhelpful and unwarranted, the libertarian firebrand wrote. Massey praised Lee, a first-term House member, as a conservative, thoughtful member of the House Judiciary Committee. She endorsed Florida Governor Ron DeSantis president, but then endorsed Trump when DeSantis got out of the race. More of my colleagues should call out these ridiculous bullying tactics, Massey finished. What followed was a post by Representative Chip Roy, who's been critical of Trump in the past. He added support by commenting co-sponsor, I guess, agreeing with Massey. So there's any great MAGA Republicans looking to run against Laura Lee. Well, that was what he was said. Prior to running for House of Representatives, Lee had served in the DeSantis administration as Florida Secretary of State from 2019 through part of 2022. So her support of DeSantis is not really reflective of being anti-Trump. She really had no choice. She really had no choice. Yeah, I don't have any big problems with Laura Lee, personally. She was the Sunshine State's top election official in 2021 when DeSantis announced Florida would not audit the 2020 presidential election, despite it urging from Trump allies. Trump won Florida over now President Biden by roughly 3%. So, yeah. Trump isn't winning himself any friends with that. <sighs> Let's get into the gag order against Trump, because I think we need to start working on that. Mm, I'm going to do this first. Let's do the decision itself first. Do this like a lawyer. Okay, Juan Mershon.
People's motion for an order restricting extrajudicial statements. Defendants charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records in the first degree in violation of penal law 175.10. Charges arise from allegations the defendant attempted the defendant attempted to conceal an illegal scheme to influence the 2016 presidential election. Specifically, the people claim that the defendant directed an attorney who worked for his company to pay $130,000 to adult film actress shortly before the election to prevent her from publicizing an alleged sexual encounter with the defendant. It's further alleged that the defendant thereafter reimbursed the attorney for the payments through a series of checks and caused business records associated with the repayments to be falsified to conceal his criminal conduct. Trial this matter is scheduled to commence on April 15th. On February 22nd, the people filed the instant motion for an order restricting extrajudicial statements by defendant for the duration of the trial. So going from now till the trial ends. The restrictions sought are consistent in part with those upheld in the U.S. Court of Appeals of the D.C. Circuit in the United States v. Trump. On March 4th, 2024, defendant filed a response in opposition, arguing that his speech may only be restricted by the application of a more strenuous standard than applied by the D.C. Circuit, and that the people have failed to meet that standard in this case. Okay, so it seems like you're giving a gag order. That seems to really be imp impinging on his First Amendment rights. The freedom of speech guaranteed by the First Amendment and the state's interest in the fair administration of justice are implicated by the relief sought. The balancing of these interests must come with the highest scrutiny. Quote, properly applied, the test requires a court to make its own inquiry into the imminence and magnitude of the danger said to flow from the particular utterance and then to balance the character of the evil as well as the likelihood against the need for free and unfettered expression. And the likelihood, and I just want to pause here and just point out that um, his need for free and unfettered expression is arguably greater than any other per defendant in history because he's got this guy's running for president. Right? You would think that if you're going to apply landmark communications versus Virginia, so his need for free and unfettered expression is far greater than yours or mine because that has real ramifications on him in the, in the, in the short and long term. The court has an obligation, as at least foreseeable, those damages to him in, in gagging him are far more foreseeably damaging to him than they would be to you or me. We wouldn't like it if we were gagged. But the impact on us is objectively less tangible than the impact it has on, on the, the RNC presidential candidate. The court has an obligation to prevent outside influences, including extrajudicial speech, from disturbing the integrity of a trial, Shepard, citing Shepard v. Maxwell. With the standards set forth in Landmark, this court has reviewed the record of prior extrajudicial statements attributed to defendants as documented in Exhibits 1 to 16 of the People's Motion for the Order Restricting Extrajudicial Statements. Notably, the defendant does not deny the utterance of any of those extrajudicial statements or the report effect those statements had on the targeted parties. Rather, the defendant argues that as the presumptive Republican, that as the presumptive Republican nominee and leading candidate for the 2024 election, he must have unfettered access to the voting public to respond to attacks from political opponents and to criticize these public figures, which I think is a fair, fair point. Yet these extrajudicial statements went far beyond defending himself against attacks by public figures. Indeed, his statements were threatening, inflammation, inflammatory, denigrating, and the targets of his statements ranged from local and federal officials, courts and court staff, prosecutors and staff assigned to the cases, and private individuals, including grand jurors, performing their civic duty. The consequences of those statements included not only fear on the part of the individual targeted, but also the assignment to increase security resources to investigate threats and protect the, the individuals and family members thereof. So he's claiming that there's a real implication, real manifestation that when he speaks, it has proven to generate greater issues. He's more of a threat. That's what Judge Merchant is claiming. Because the impact of his words have greater weight. Such inflammatory extrajudicial statements undoubtedly risk impeding the orderly administration of this court. Defendant contends that continued compliance with the existing orders referencing both the court's admonition at the start of the proceedings and the recent protective order issued on March 7, 2024 with respect to juror anonymity is an effective, less restrict, restrictive alternative. So there's already these different guidelines which are in effect to try and ensure that Trump 
is not going to be causing any harms to these any harms to a potential juror, scaring them or having any impact on them. He supports this position by noting that he has generally refrained from making extrajudicial statements about individuals associated with the instant case, in marked contrast with the significant volume of social media posts and other statements targeting individuals involved in every other court proceeding reflecting in the court in the people's submission. And I think that this is true. I've noticed we've seen him go very hard after Jack Smith. We've seen him go after Fannie Willis. We've seen him talk about Jack Smith, Jack Smith, Jack Smith a lot. We saw him go after Judge Engeron. And how crooked he and his and he Trump believes he and his clerk are in the way they conduct their courtroom. But the name Judge Merchant doesn't come up very much. And you don't hear him talk about Alvin Bragg very much. You don't hear him talk about this case very much at all. At all. Other than calling it a joke. But he really has not. He's with respect to the, the allegations in this case, if you go through your timeline, I'm fairly certain you will find that if you look at the percentage of time he's talked about cases and you took them all in the aggregate and said, let's, these are the, the 2000 times he's ever talked publicly about these cases, about all these civil and criminal cases, E. Jean Carroll, Judge, um, Judge Engeron, her clerk, I mean, up and down. And you say, what percentage was he talking about Engeron? What percentage was he talking about this? And you said, what percentage was he talking about this case? I'm sure it would be less than 10%. And probably less than, and, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if it was much less than 5%. He talks about this case very, very little. The court is unpersuaded. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. The court, unpersuaded. Who would have guessed? Although this court did not issue the an order restrict defendant speech at the exception of this case, choosing instead to issue an admonition, given the nature and impact of statements made against this court and family member thereof, the district attorney and the assistant district attorney, the witnesses in this case, as well as the nature and impact of the extrajudicial statements made by the defendant in the D.C. Circuit case, which resulted in the D.C. Circuit issuing an, an order restricting his speech. And given that the eve of trial is upon us, it is without question that the imminency of the risk of harm is now paramount. Yeah, but he's also in a different position now. Now he's the presumptive RNC nominee. So, shouldn't we be that much more cautious about restricting his free speech? Free speech as it relates to politics is the most important free speech. The Supreme Court in both Nebraska Press Associ Association v. Stewart and Shepard v. Maxwell holds that the court has the obligation to prevent actual harm to the integrity of the proceedings. Where is there going to be an actual harm? When the fairness of the trial is threatened, reversals are but palliatives. The cure lies in those remedial measures that will prevent the prejudice at its inception. What prejudice do you think is going to happen here? This is why I don't understand. What prejudice is going to happen? Where? Where's the prejudice? On the record submitted in keeping with this mandate, this court need not wait for the realization of further prescribed speech targeted at the, pr pr the prin participants of this trial. The people propose an additional restriction on speech with respect to prospective and sworn jurors. The restrictions sought are an extension of the previously issued protective order regarding juror anonymity, which I agree that jurors should remain anonymous. While D.C. Circuit Court addressed only the risks of influencing witnesses and intimidating and harassing other trial participants in accordance with the lower court's ruling, it nevertheless opined that one of the most powerful interests supporting broad prohibitions on trial part participants' speech is to avoid contamination of the jury pool, to protect the impartiality of the jury once selected, to confine the evidentiary record before the jury to the courtroom, and to prevent intrusion on the jury's deliberations. Meaning, if we allow him to start attacking the jury or scare the jury that he's going to attack them, that could influence their jury deliberations, and they're just that's a way of basically strong arming the jury into into doing your bidding so that's the concern that the judge is expressing that if he goes running off of the mouth he's going to scare some little old lady who's sitting in the jury and she's gonna be like i have to find the otherwise he's going to be mad at me he's going to embarrass me on tv so i can understand that i can understand that i really don't have a problem with gagging him as to the jury for the duration of the trial i don't have a problem with that 
While the protective order related to jury anonymity prevents the dissemination of certain... I mean, I don't like the idea of guy being gagged at all. But if you're going to gag anything... Okay, that I sort of get. Prevents the dissemination of certain personal information is not sufficient to prevent extrajudicial speech targeting jurors and exposing them to an atmosphere of intimidation. The proposed restrictions relating to jurors are narrowly tailored to, obs to obtain that result. The uncontested record, I just think that this is so gross in the assumption that he's going to do this when he hasn't talked about this case at all. The uncontested record reflecting the defendant's prior extrajudicial statements establishes sufficient, sufficient risk to the administration of justice. What about the fact that he hasn't talked about this case? I don't care about that. I care about what he's done in other cases. That sounds crazy. Therefore, it is hereby ordered that the people's motion for restriction on extrajudicial statements by the defendant is granted to the extent the defendant is directed to refrain from the following. So what is he not allowed to do? This is the most important part here. It's not just that there's a gag. What is the gag covering? And this is interesting, the way he goes. A, making or directing others to make. So let's just, you, you or you, neither Trump nor through an agent can he make public statements about known or reasonably foreseeable witnesses concerning their potential, potential participation in the investigation or in this criminal proceeding. So that's a way to get him, I guess, to back off of Michael Cohen, who's expected to be a witness. You can't talk about Stormy Daniels or anyone else who they anticipate is going to may appear at this trial. B. Making or directing others to make public statements about counsel in the case, other than the district attorney. So you can't talk about Alvin Bragg. But you can't talk about other members of Alvin Bragg's office. So this is actually opening up a little bit of a doorway for him, where you can go after Alvin Bragg and basically call him, you know, Fat Alvin, whatever you want to call him, not suggesting anything that'll come up with something better than Trump will. I'm just saying that if he wants to call him, you know, crazy Fat Alvin. Um, that's his prerogative under this order. Members of the court staff and the district attorney's staff, so you can't go after them. But the court staff is not the court. It's not Judge Merchant. He can attack Judge Merchant. Or three, the family members of any council or staff member, if those statements are made with the intent to materially interfere with or cause others to materially interfere with council or staff's work in the criminal case or the knowledge of such inference is likely to result. And three, making and directing others to make public statements about any prospective juror or any juror in this criminal proceeding. So, this is a gag order. But Newsweek points out that this is a little bit different than the gag order he's got in other cases. It's less restrictive. And I think this is a fair, this is an important thing to note. Now, the news gag order has key differences than the previous ones. The latest gag order against Donald Trump has a noble difference in the past court restrictions. The order issued on Tuesday only applies to what the former president can say about his hush money, not a hush money case. It's not a hush money case. It's a bookkeeping case. It's a, book, it's a bookkeeping case, not a hush money case. It's bookkeeping. So what the former president can say about his hush money case that heads into the next trial month. Judge Juan Mershen, who's overseeing the criminal case, brought, brought against Trump by Manhattan District Attorney Alan Bragg on Tuesday, barred the former president from making public statements about individuals involved in the case. The order came hours after Trump attacked Merchant and his daughter in a post on True Social, calling the judge a certified Trump hater. Let's check out what he said about the, the Judge, the judge and his daughter. This is latest attack on the judge. You're going to show. He wrote, Judge Juan Mershan, a very distinguished looking man, is nevertheless a true and certified Trump hater who suffers from a very serious case of Trump derangement syndrome. <laughs> In other words, he hates me. His daughter is a senior executive of the super liberal Democrat firm that works for Adam Shifty Schiff, the Democrats' national committee, Democrat Senate majority PAC, and even crooked Joe Biden. In a separate post, Trump ar argued that Merchant should recuse himself from the case, are in the trial, should be removed to a more conservative New York City borough of Staten Island. Judge Merchant should recuse himself. He cannot give me a fair trial. Likewise, for the sake of fairness, this, this political opponent trial should take place in Staten Island with a new and unbiased judge. The trial should not be allowed to start in the middle of my campaign for president, Trump wrote. 
So right after making that, Judge Merchand showed some level of restraint in not protecting his, even his, whether that covers his daughter, does it cover his daughter? Court, members of the court staff. I don't think he's a court staff, district attorney staff. I don't think the court staff means the judge. The family members of any counselor, a counselor staff member. I think he's he left open that you can go after his daughter for his the daughter's relationship to shift. I think that's left open here. I think that's left open, and I think Judge Merchant did it on purpose. And the reason he would do that on purpose is to say, see, I wasn't looking out for myself. I really care. I wasn't, this isn't a selfish thing because he's able to still come after me and come after my own daughter. But it's really in the interest of justice. It gives it gives fortitude to this order and its likelihood of standing scrutiny by the court. Because the more he would use this order to protect himself from being publicly scrutinized, the more biased it looks, the more self-interested it looks. and And that he's more inclined to ignore basic civil rights of the accused. But in allowing Trump to continue attacking him, even after the day after he's been attacked, he sort of gives the impression that that this is that his motivation is not personal, but that his motivation is to actually affect what he's looking to affect, which is to protect the integrity of the trial. Is that what he's really trying to do? I don't know. I don't know. It's tough for me to weigh in on that. In a four-page order, which was in response to gag order request from, Bert, from Bragg, Merchant directed the former president to refrain from making statements about potential witnesses, prosecutors, and DA staff members, or any prospective jurors in the case. And, yeah. They go through the other gag orders. So there you go. Honestly, I thought this gag order might be worse than it was. That's correct. You're correct, Kimmy. He did. He did. And properly so, because she deserves to be called out, because they're all a bunch of... Why is it everyone who's coming after him is basically has family and surrounded by people who despise Trump? And you could be right, hands packed, when you say Trump did not talk about the Alvin case because it was pushed to the back burner by the other cases. Now Alvin needs to bring it forward after all the other cases delayed, which that could be a reason to have concerns that now he's going to he's going to turn his attention on this case. All gag orders need to be for both sides. It should be that that I would agree with. I don't know if they, but in order for that to happen, he he would have had to move for a gag order on them, which he may yet do. He may yet do. So there you go. That was that. Gag order on Trump. Last but not least. Last but not least. Tulsi Gabbard. You all remember her. You all remember her. Tulsi Gabbard. Made an hour long into had an hour long interview with Tucker Carlson. I don't I'm not going through the entire thing with you tonight. Definitely not going to do that. A couple of things that I do want to go through because I understand that most of you, for one reason or another, are probably somewhat right leaning. Although it takes all kinds here, takes all kinds. I am curious how you guys feel about Tulsi. Mm -hmm. Let me see. This is. Let's see why she left the Democrats. Because if she's going to now be potential the RNC vice presidential can vice presidential candidate, I think we need to see why she, according to her, she left the Democratic Party. I know some of you really like her. Some of you really don't. I know that. I know that. I got that. I have a very mixed feelings on her. I have very mixed feelings. 
I think she's a better choice than Tim Scott. Um, I can see the upside to her. Let's see what we got. Um, the party of war. Uh, in, in every respect, uh, un unfortunately, the Democrat Party has become a party that is is undermining the very fabric of our country, of our freedom, of our constitution and the rule of law, uh, which is why ultimately I, I left the Democratic Party and I'm why it's why I am sounding the alarm bells as we head into this very critical election year about really what's at stake. The reason I'm, that I know you're sincere is because you left the Democratic Party at exactly the moment that it solidified its position as the party of the rich. Yeah. And there's so many rewards that you can receive if you sign up. So I, I know a million people who've moved in the other direction, you know, Joe Scarborough or <laughs> Stuart Stevens or yeah. Steve Schmidt or all the guys from the Lincoln Project, Bill Crystal. Right. And they've all been rewarded for it a lot because there's a lot of money to pass around if you do that. Mm -hmm. And, but you left at exactly the moment <laughs> when you could have gotten kind of rich by staying and reading the talking points. Yeah, it, it when I first got elected in uh, 2012, it was it was it was a race that I was not supposed to win. If you listen to anybody who knew anything about politics, um, and I I won that election, zero support from any you know local or national Democratic Party individuals or the party as a whole. Huh. It, it was, imagine this, uh, the people's voices were heard through their votes and they were sick and tired of, of the pay to play corrupt politics and uh, wanted a new direction and a fresh direction of leadership. This is a great, this is a great point. This is a great point. Look at how he went after Laurel Lee for just supporting DeSantis. She voted twice to impeach Donald. That's a great point. And so it was, it was a hard fought uh, election, but I, I had no idea what was in store when I actually went to Washington. So what did you notice? I mean, Hawaii, well, first should, of all, obviously it's very far away. It's just so far it is. physically from DC. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, and, and you would think in the age of technology, that distance wouldn't matter so much, but it kind of does. Yeah, it does in some a ways. lot. Um, but shortly after my primary election, I got a call from Nancy Pelosi saying, hey, do you want to uh, speak during prime time at the Democratic convention coming up? And I was like, uh, yes. How old were you? I was 31. What a trip. That must be and I said I would like to speak about veterans. Um, I was serving in the Hawaii National Guard at the time. I'm still serving the U.S. Army Reserve now. But to me, hey, here's an opportunity to speak to millions of people across the country about the people who are nearest and dearest to my heart, my brothers and sisters. And so the whole thing was, it was quite surreal because I didn't, I didn't seek it out. I didn't know, I didn't know how that machine worked. Uh, but I found myself getting these phone calls, uh, from people within the democratic party, like, Hey, go and speak at this, like premier event that like most people don't get invitations to. And, a couple of weeks after I was in office, I got See, a call. And this is where I start getting into the whole purity test thing, right? This is where I start getting into the whole purity test thing. I, 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 I struggle. I struggle with like, we see this. Um, how do I phrase this? I've seen Robert Barnes attack Shipwreck Crew as being basically a neocon hack. Shipwreck Crew attacking Tulsi Gabbard as being unreliable. It's like, it becomes so difficult for you or I to actually figure out like who the heck is trustworthy? Like who can we, how, who can we put our confidence in? And I'm sure that many of you struggle with that because you'll see, you'll be like, I like this person. I like that person. Why does this person seem to hate that person? And then why is, and I like this third person who that person seems to hate. And I, and you and, and tells me I shouldn't trust. And there's, this constant just just purity tests that it's like it's it makes it so hard it's one of the, it's one of the most challenging things of this america first thing although frankly i think that the left probably has a similar problem as well i'm sure the left has a similar problem when they see friction between let's say aoc and anna kasparian about whether the migrant crisis is a real problem or not where aoc tries to gaslight her viewers and anna 
and Anna Kasparian calls that out as being complete BS. You know, so I think that this is something that it's we're sort of like left because we're we're shoved into camps. I just want you all to just consider a thought that I have on this. Because we're we're shoved into camps of are you with us or are you against us? You're, you're either with us or you're against us. Well, then when we see these people who seem to hold positions or have taken steps that are frust are frustratingly against an America first perspective, <laughs> we're left sort of trying to figure out whether or not they merit our support and our attention. And it's it's very I think we need to start grading on tiers. It's the only way that you can actually you can actually try to make any sense out of any of this. I, I know I've heard Robert Barnes killing on shipwreck crew. And I'll tell you this much, I heard Shipwreck Crew say a lot of things I really like and respect. And you know, I, I you know I have deep respect for Robert Barnes. And it, and so now you tell me Shipwreck Crew is hating on Tulsi. There's certain things I like about Tulsi also. Certain things I, you know, I sort of have questions about. So I think you sort of need to start building tiers of credibility and where you're putting your trust. And perhaps continually reassessing based on new information. It makes it much more challenging to feel like you're an informed citizen. And advocating for something that you can be confident you'll be advocating for a year from now. It, it's very unsettling in that sense. Because it feels as if the sands shift a lot. And all of a sudden, someone who I thought I could trust just ends up being someone I feel like I can't trust it at all. And it's very, it's just very, we're living in very murky times. Like very, very murky times. I don't know. It's just a thought that I had that I wanted to share with you all. And people jumping around in which camps they're in. All saying, hey, what would you say if you I'm were curious about your thoughts about that? And if you're watching after the show, you could drop a comment about that. Like, do you think it's more, do you think it's always been like this? Or is this relative? I think because of social media, we're more mm, camp rather than issue. We're more about the person than about the issue. I think we're, we're naturally pushed in that direction today than perhaps we, we people vote Americans were generations last generation or the generation before that to serve as vice chair of the DNC. And I was just literally my response was like, what does a vice chair of the DNC do? I don't know nothing about this. What, what do you really want from me? What are you asking of me? Uh, ultimately said yes, because this is an opportunity to be in a position to make some positive change. Uh, but these kinds of things kept on happening uh, over over the, yeah, it was kind of my first year, first couple of years in office. But, and, and you'll appreciate this, one of the major turning points uh, that started to slow down the the the, the fanfare and and like the, the headlines of like, I remember there was one at the Democratic convention. I don't know if it was CNN or MSN. Some, someone was like, oh, I wonder who's going to play Tulsi Gabbard in a movie. And like all this stuff, I'm like, this is so weird. But that summer of 2013, my first year in Congress, um, as you know, one of the main reasons that I ran for Congress was because of the experiences that I'd had on both of my Middle East deployments, uh, where I experienced the cost of war firsthand, serving in a medical unit. And I wanted to be in a position where I could help influence and impact those foreign policy decisions that were directly impacting uh, my brothers and sisters in uniform. I didn't realize that um, my opportunity to be able to do that would happen so quickly, but it was August of 2013 that President Obama announced, then President Obama announced that he was going to seek authorization to use military force from Congress to go and drop some bombs on Syria in what would be kind of the first volley of regime change war there. And um, I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee at the time, August, most members of Congress are at home during recess. And I was home in my district. And I remember like it was yesterday, uh, 
pumping gas at the gas station. And this woman came up to me and I'd never met her before. Local, local lady came. She grabbed my arm and looked at me with this intensity in her eyes, telling me that her son had just come home from Iraq and she had been terrified that he wouldn't come home. He was finally home with her and now they wanted to they wanted to send him back to another war in another country and begged me please Tulsi don't let them take my son from me. Jeez. And as the next couple of days went on, I would bump into more people like that in the supermarket or just around town who were absolutely terrified. Um, I went back to Washington. We held all the committee hearings, open hearings, classified briefings, and I went in with an open mind saying, give me all of the information. Um, I want to make sure that I do my due diligence before I take a position or, or make a decision on this. And ultimately, uh, Secretary Kerry came in and briefed us. The answers to very direct questions that I had, such as, what is our objective? What, what is your objective in wanting to go and start another war in another country? Uh, what do you, how do you think they will respond? Uh, what will you do next? What is that second, third, fourth order of, of effects and consequences that will always happen? Uh, and the, the, the question, you know, when I said, what is your objective? Uh, I believe it was secretary Kerry or someone from the state department who said, well, you know, we don't want to deliver a, a, a de decapitation. We don't want it to be a pinprick. We want this to be a punch in the gut and send a message. And my question was, okay, so a punch in the gut, like, what will you do when they respond? And they said, well, we don't think they'll, we don't think there'll be a response. That's your plan. You don't think there will be a response. <laughs> Gary said, if that? somebody came up and punched you in the gut, would you like just not respond? <laughs> if they don't respond, they've got some pretty, you know, weaponized, powerful friends. Uh, you don't think they'll respond. And what if they don't respond to us, but they respond by attacking some of our friends who may be in the region. All of these different kinds of questions, there's like, well, we just don't think they'll do that. Well, what happens next? Well, you know, we think this will send a strong message. And, and it's the same kind of like political BS talk that means nothing and is so disconnected <laughs> from the reality of the people on the ground who have to live with those consequences. And it really surprised me. And maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but it surprised me that after so many years of looking back at the massive mistakes of Iraq, that they could be so glib and just saying, oh, we'll just go drop some bombs and send a message and, and that'll be it. They learned nothing. They learned nothing. And so I, I penned an op-ed and uh, published it. And I was, I was certainly the first Democrat maybe the first member of Congress to, to come out in opposition to President Obama's request. And uh, within hours of publishing that op-ed, I got a call from the White House uh, and essentially Shoot out. what they said was, F how you. dare you? Yep. How dare you go against your president? How, how dare you go against the president who you? came from your home state? not a moment of the conversation. There wasn't much of a conversation, first of all, but they were not interested at all in the reason for my opposition, which I, I stated pretty clearly in the op-ed how, how well uh, thought out this decision was. It was not made haphazardly. They weren't interested in my experience that I brought that helped inform my decision of having deployed twice to the Middle East before. Uh, and it it told me a lot about them that they were more uh, concerned with and they cared more about like being a good member of the team and go team Obama and go team Democrats than they were concerned about um, the actual consequences of the very serious request that he was saying he would come to Congress with. It sent a strong message to them as well that I wasn't the person that they thought I was going to be.
in in someone who could be puppeteered, who could be bullied into just uh, going along with the boss or whatever they had in mind. Uh, that was kind of the beginning of of their realization that oh, okay, this one thinks for herself and she's not afraid to take a stand. So I mean, at that point, you know, they have two options. They can either try and crush you. You're freshmen, so it's mm. a little early for that. And yeah. They've also ginned up the publicity machine on your behalf. You probably weren't even aware of this, but oh. most people come, most congressmen come to Washington. No one ever hears. No one knows they're there. Yeah, well, everyone knew you were there. Yeah. So they can try and crush you, or they can try and suborn you, bribe you, give you stuff to win you over. Yeah. What did they try? Um, you know, it, it's it is kind of the public things. Like I, I remember, and, and I think you'll get a kick out of this, being invited to the White House correspondence dinner my first year in Congress. Yeah. I had guys who were, who've been in Congress that coming up to me saying, Gosh, Tulsi. How come you got invited? I've been here for four terms, eight years, and I still haven't gotten invited to that. And I was, uh, you know, I was like, do you want to go? <laughs> I really don't like going to these kind of things. I hate these big kind of parties and social things. Like, you can have my seat. But, but it was that kind of thing where, oh, go to this embassy for this fancy party. Like, all this stuff that unfortunately... The trappings of Washington, basically. That's what she's saying. Um... Postman says, hashtag 4325 reporting for duty. Love this show since first minute I discovered you. Oh, that's so thoughtful. Thank you. That's so nice, Postman. Now I'm a member on Locals. Is this the correct way to buy my way into the unit, to the uncult? I have no tinfoil, but iron on numbers for tracksuit. That's perfect. That's perfect. The tracksuit's not mandatory. It's not at all mandatory. Not, not, not at all. You're not at all. And I appreciate you, you shutting the tinfoil. I appreciate that. Karen Manning says, no way is perfect. I tried for years to figure out what a true conservative is. There's no box I fit in value-wise. What do you think? You know, <clears throat> I constantly const I constantly talk about the following being about greater unity and community and personal growth. And I'm sure you all think then I'm joking about that. I'm sure you all think that that I'm joking about that. And yeah, there's always a little bit of humor that I'm going to try to inject to the best of my, my relatively poor abilities. But there's also truth in that I do think that part of what I try to bring by getting by doing what I do is to help give people a community of like-minded people who they're able to find and share values with. And I do think it's important to constantly question your own values and reassess, like, and try to figure out morality. And I think that's part of, of, of embettering yourself and your development as a better person. And that's one of the reasons I have these philosophical conversations sometimes with you where I'm just sort of trying to speculate or, or play, you know, look at the other side of the coin, you know, the other day, for example, I was like, I was like considering like, you know, people who do the right thing, but for terribly wrong reasons. I'm trying to remember the context. I was thinking about this like yesterday morning. Maybe it was this morning. I don't know. I lose track of time. But, you know, and I, I was, and I don't, I'm trying to remember the political context that I was thinking of. Maybe it was, I was thinking about Tulsi Gabbard. I'm not sure. But I don't remember what it was I was thinking, but I was thinking about like these people who do the, end up doing the right thing, but for terribly wrong reasons. Is that something that we should be happy about or be, you know, should we support that? Should we not on principle? And, and I got very biblical in my, in my perspective on it. I'm not going to go down that whole road with you now, but I was like, just thinking about like different developments through time, which seem to be grounded in things that in, in objectives that were ignoble, where the result ended up bringing about something that was phenomenal. And, and that maybe like a lot of times that, that, you know, we sort of sit and criticize the basis of how something, ha of the, the genesis of something being in an immoral basis, whereas the result ends up being something that's very positive. 
that we just sort of end up being very critical of even the results because of the moorings being something that is not particularly noble. I was I was try I'm trying to remember what it was that I was thinking of that made me think of this when I started getting this whole biblical philosophy about this and different examples in, in Genesis and the book of Samuel. Anyway, but <clears throat> the reason I bring this up in this context is because you ask what's a true conservative, you know, and we, we could look at like, um, what is, um, I don't, I don't know that I can give you an answer about what a true conservative is. First of all, there's different types of conservatism. There's, cons there's conservatism from the perspective of socially versus economically. And I don't know that I'm the, that I have the expertise or the qualifications to say that this is what makes someone conservative versus not conservative. I'm simply just constantly trying to struggle with my own values. What I, what I tend to do is I tend to look at something and I'll say, this makes me feel a certain way. Either positive or negative. And I'll explore that emotion that I, feel, I tend to feel inside at first. And then I'll try to understand what made me feel that way about it to try to dissect it and understand it. And that, I feel like, gives me a better understanding of myself. Because so I think that my, my gut reaction to things is, is like my true take on it. So then I'm like, okay, so what about this makes it different? That, what, why did this feel different than something else which seems dim, similar that didn't make me feel that way, either in a positive or negative way? And that, that's where I try to basically critically analyze that distinction and better understanding my perspectives on things. And sometimes I'll be fleshing them out on stream with you. Like I'll say, like I remember I've had multiple conversations where it's like, I sort of feel like I, I'm, I'm talking it out with you guys and coming to conclusions that I did not have at, even when I start the conversation that I'm like, yeah, okay, you know what? That, that's really what it is. No, no, it feels closer and it doesn't feel perfectly right. And while I'm talking out with you guys, I'll actually understand my perspective on that particular issue better. I don't know if that helps in the de definition of conservatism, so to speak. I don't know if being a conservative is an objective that is unto itself healthy. I think conservatism is probably something that is just perhaps consistent with a lot of what you internally feel is right. But that doesn't mean that it necessarily is definition of morality. It's just a perspective on things. It doesn't mean it's always the proper perspective. It just tends to be a healthiest approach in more cases than not. I don't know if anything I said made sense. To be fair, I think a lot of what I said probably is going to go over the head of a lot of people. Maybe not you. Maybe you understood what I'm saying. I'm sure others, I'm sure... There, there are many of you out there who don't understand what I'm trying to express here. I don't feel like I'm doing a very a very good job in expressing it. But perhaps some of you were able to take something from my response to that. Uh, Joe, great show, but you... Check your phone, just text you got shanked by YouTube for two or three minutes today. Really? Why? What? What the hell's wrong with YouTube? Son of a. Tucker did that to me? Tucker did that to me?
I don't see anything here. That's so weird. I didn't get a notification. Normally I get a notification. I didn't get any notification. All right. I got no notification about this. It wasn't on my screen. I didn't get any notification. Maybe it was cyber attack. Maybe it was the same people who took down the boat. I've been dollied. I see, I'm looking. I, I'm looking at my email. I see no notification. They always send me a notification in the middle of the stream, telling me, "Hey, hey, watch it." What the heck happened? All right, let me go back and see. What the hell is happening here? I got no notification about this being monetized or any, everything is still monetized. I'm still green. What point, what point was all, you had black screen, but could you hear me? Could you hear me or you couldn't even hear me? This is on Rumble also. I'm looking at you, Rumble. Was there a problem with you? Where the hell? Can you send me a screenshot on my phone? All right, let me see. Let me see. Now I have to go back to my own. Mm. Mm. That must be a glitch because I wasn't even showing. I'm looking at what happened here. I don't think it was Tucker. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you myself here. We're gonna, I'm going to share you with you what I'm seeing here. All right. Let me see. Now I got to see. Ooh. All right, so this is me watching me. Let me. I don't think it was Tucker. Okay. 
Yeah, I wasn't even showing Tucker when I when I when the stream went dead. It's not that long. It's only like a, a minute. Let's see what I said. In that I do think that part of what I try to bring. Support that? Should we not on principle? And and I got very biblical in my in my perspective on it. Oh, I'm wow. not going to go down that whole road with you now. All right. Anyway, yeah, I didn't think it was Tucker, and it wasn't Tucker because it wasn't while I was playing Tucker even. I'm happy to see that 58% of you do not want Laura Loomer. That makes me feel good. All right. Well, I'm going to go back to Laura. I'm going to go back to this then. I want to get to the main part here, which is at the very end of the Tulsi Gabbard thing. I wasn't talking about scripture when I started it. What I was basically answering this question from Karen Mannings, who was, who was asking me what a true conservative was. And what I essentially was saying was that I frequently talk about how you know the following is about community unity and greater personal growth. And I know that you all think that I'm making a joke when I'm talking about that, but I'm really not. I think that what I bring here with this show is I bring a place where people who have similar type of values to gather together and talk amongst themselves while also hearing me engage with you. And that I can't, I'm not the expert to tell you what a conservative is. I'm not the only voice in what a conservative is. I don't know that even being a conservative is an objective unto itself. I think we're all searching for better morality. And that what we need to basically do is instead of judging people, judge issues. And I recommended that what I personally do is I try to look inside myself when I see something that's complicated and I'm not sure which way is the right way to look at it, which way is the right way to approach it. I usually have a gut feeling, which is positive or negative. And then I'll ask myself, why is that the way that I feel? Why do I like this? Or why do I dislike this? What about it is bothering me? And I'll take that feeling and I'll engage in critical analysis about trying to break down that particular issue as to why something about it bothers me. And then I'll try and compare it to similar circumstances where I may not feel as bothered, or maybe I did feel bothered, and ask what parallels it has, or what distinctions it has that makes me feel differently or similar to other examples of A, B, and C. And that way I sort of am able to better understand my own sense of morality, where instead of me just feeling a certain way about something, I'm able to better flesh out why I feel that way and how I come to that conclusion and what just sits right with me and what doesn't. So in a large part of, of my perspective on issues is, is formed that way. And sometimes you, I'll, I'll even go through the experience with you. Well, I'll be like sort of thinking through how I feel about certain things. I was talking about in that when I, before I got to the whole biblical thing, I was talking about context of where like, let's say someone ends up doing something for the wrong reasons that have a very positive outcome. So how should we look at someone in that circumstance? How should we judge that, that, that entire circumstance? And that's when I started talking about how, you know, I was looking at examples in scripture where, People who seem to do things that are really wrong ultimately lead to very positive outcomes. And you're sort of wondering, like, what, what do we make out of that? But anyway, my point is that when I start thinking about these different things, so I'll sort of try to just assess. I, I start with a feeling, and then I try to understand why I have that feeling. And I think that that helps me grow. I think that's ultimately what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to try and that personal growth that I'm always referring to and community and unity and greater personal growth is that by opening this show up on a regular basis, I'm giving you an opportunity to interact with other people. Yeah, hear my thoughts on it also, but you're also interacting with other people in the chat 
and engaging with them. And it's an opportunity for you to speak with people who have similar values in a lot of different ways, and sometimes very contrasting values. And hopefully through that dialogue, you have your own personal growth. I mean, just because I feel a certain way about something doesn't mean you're going to feel that way about it. We sort of need to define morality. While I do believe there's objective morality, I think that it is a bit of a struggle for each for each, for us each to come to grips with what we recognize as being proper morality. And if you have exposure, and it's only through discussion and dialogue, and that's part of what I appreciate about this show, is that I have an opportunity to engage with thousands of you and hear different ideas that I otherwise would not be exposed to while I express myself. So that's essentially what I was trying to, to get at. And I was saying, like, I don't know that being a conservative unto itself is a value. I think that it tends to be a healthy starting point for coming to good values. I don't think that it unto itself is like a thing that is like an ideal for human. That it unto itself is necessarily always the measure of purity. If that makes sense. It's just in a lot of different ways. It's a healthy way to approach life. Pony Up says general politics aren't a good litmus test anymore. Specific positions on crime, the border reveal politicians' agendas. Unfortunately, activism has pierced the courts and it's killing our republic. That's definitely true. Prospering Woman says Tulsi wasn't in Congress during the impeachment. She was there in 2013. What was her? Con Let me see what her Tulsi. Wikipedia. I'm curious. Uh, she was the U.S. representative for Hawaii's 2nd Congressional District from 2013 to 2021. So she was in Congress. I believe you're mistaken. How'd she vote? I don't know. Are you even aware YouTube spending a stream? You came back mid sentence. I was not aware. No, they didn't give, they still haven't given me a notice. I think it was a stream issue. I don't think it was even necessarily YouTube. I think it was a stream yard thing because Rumble had a problem too. So, yeah. So there's that. I'm going to get to her her comments about becoming Trump, potentially becoming Trump's vice president, because that's really what I wanted from her in this in this conversation here. Um, who was I? Oh yeah, like and subscribe. That's what that's telling you. Uh, Monkey training. The Mexican stand up between DW. Candace and Crowder tells me two things. One, politics ruins everything. Two, pol political people are the worst. Yeah, okay. So I didn't even know Crowder was involved in that whole thing. Um, uh, this is also what I'm talking about, the whole purity test thing. And who's good and who's not good and whatever. I just can't. I just can't. It's so aggravating. You have to take people and basically say, do I agree with them? That's the only way you can actually find truth. Is basically say, what do I agree with? Do I agree with them on this perspective or not? And I'm, I'm urging you to fight the urge to trust in the person and just continually employ your brain, no matter who the messenger is. That's what I'd urge you all to do. I think that's really, you want to know what? That's what I think conservatism is. I think conservatism is not going with a person. I think conservatism is going with an idea and understanding what ideas are have merit. And that requires effort and critical analysis. So yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't I can't explain it. I think to me that's that's like what is real conservatism? I don't know. 
Real question. Is it even possible someone tells you to ever tr to earn trust after flipping? They either flip too soon or too late, so they're just locked in one side forever. I can only think of Trump who has done it. Trump has gotten away with it. Because he was pretty far left. I don't know. Elon's done it too. Elon was pretty far left, and now the right hails him as a hero, and the left hates him. It's a good question as to what enables someone to do it. What enables someone to do it? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Why is it some people are successful at it and others struggle with the flip? I don't know. That's a very good question. And thank you, Valiant, for... for for trying to notify me. Also, you think Candace jumped the shark and Israeli friend of mine reached out a month back wondering why she and Tucker were being anti-Semitic. Okay. I'm going to tell you this. I don't know anything about whether or not Candace is anti-Semitic. I don't I have no idea about anything about that. Okay. I have no, I'm not labeling. It's not my job to label people Semitic or anti-Semitic or, 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 or pro-Semitic or anti-Semitic. I'm not, I'm, this is not what I'm doing. I will tell you this. I rather than just screaming anti Semite, or, or I think the healthiest thing is basically ask people why they come to the conclusions they come to. This is consistent with what I was talking about earlier as far as being conservative. It's a matter of like, okay, so like, and you can try and postulate in ways and be like, the way I, I did earlier, I don't know if you were here earlier, Monk and Train, I was talking about this, I was talking about this topic when someone was asking me about. You know, popular phrase that's developing now, that phrase, which is uh, the whole king thing. Um, and I was like, you know, you sort of have to ask, what's the motivation here? Like, why is it that this is the way you're framing something? You, there's a guy whose video I showed yesterday. I showed part of it. I didn't show the, the end of it. The end part of it was starting to like be like something. I don't even know why he's going down this road. And he did a follow-up, and he's fairly – he's developing a lot of popularity now because he's doing these exposés on, on P. Diddy and these lengthy explanations of these breakdowns and his, pop, and his popularity is growing now. And I happen to be in a private group with him. And he did a whole thing talk, analyzing MJ and whether MJ was really the child molester that he was portrayed to be or whether that's, that was overhyped. And again, he just started basically, you know, talking about Jews in the music industry. And I basically, and I said to him, I said, and I said, I'm really just very curious. Do you think that these people in the music industry, do you think it's because they're Jews? That that's why they're this? Or because rich people tend to become self-entitled a-holes? And there happen to be a lot of Jews who are rich in, the, in that industry. So in other words, you know, if Klaus Schwab was there, you think it would be, it would be better. You think he would be acting any differently? You think Bill Gates was there in that industry? He would be any better? I don't know. You see, you think, in other words, do you, does anyone say? Yeah, no one ever phrases the story as, you know, Christian P. Diddy is accused of diddling. Yeah, they never, they never bother mentioning that. Nor should they. It'd be stupid. But somehow, and that's why I'm like, why are you even mentioning it? You could just talk about their names unless you, the only reason I mention it is if you think that there's some sort of relevance to it, as if that's a factor here in the entire story. And if you think it's a factor, then tell me tell me what your theory is as to why it's a factor. Is it, do you think that there's some sort of cabal that's doing this? Do you think that's part of their DNA? Like, what makes you think that that's relevant to the story any more than the color of their hair is relevant to the story? And that's what I, you know, that's, and it, Instead of being like accusatory, I'm just be like, just explain to me what your thought, what your thought process is. Maybe there's a logical thought process. It could be. It could be. But that having conversation instead of just labeling, but having conversation gives you an opportunity to basically have people either recognize that what they're saying sounds retarded, or at least provide some sort of justification, which may which may express genuine racism see it's not me labeling you just you tell me what's going through your head do you tell me what leads you to say that 
And I think it's a healthier approach rather than it's like, it's not my job to label you. You label yourself. You tell me what it is that's going through your head. I don't know what's going through your head. You tell me what's going through your head. And let people just decide for themselves what, what they think of that. And I think that's the healthiest way. Like, uh, like I'm, st- I'm, t- I'm so tired of trying to label, like, what is is this someone here? This is the whole part of what camp are you in? It's It's so self-destructive. Instead, it's just a healthier thing to just say, you tell me why you think this. And what you how you answer that is going to display whether it's, you know, whether your motivation is rooted in logic or in or in just hatred. And there are some people who are motivated by hatred. It's not for me to even call them out. It's just like you see for yourself what they are. Let them let people identify themselves. That's what free speech is all about, my brother. So that's what it's all about. And that's why free speech for everyone, everyone is a very important thing, even especially for people who are racist. This is where we all know it. You sort of got to poke and sort of question. I'm not question with aggression or hostility. Just be like, you tell me what your thinking is. Walk us through it. What, what's your what's your philosophy here? And let people reach their own conclusions. And if you ask me what my conclusion is, I'll tell you what my conclusion is after I hear your answer. So yeah, what do I know about Candace Owens? I have no idea. I'll tell you, I've I've listened a lot more to what Tucker has said. I don't think Tucker is anti-Semitic. I don't really listen very much to Candace Owens. So I don't know everything she said. I know she's a big fight with Shmuel Boutaq. I think what's I think something Shmuel Boutaq has said, I'd be like, I, I definitely would not have done that. I'm not really I'm not really comfortable with that. It's just you know reality. I said, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, brother. Stream laws propulsion. No <laughs> it's external interference, so all is good. This is true. I'm innocent. You're very innocent, Karen. Very, very innocent. Tulsi Congress 113, 116. First vote Congress 117. But she went back? She went back and forth? Is that what happened? Uh, she was in office 2013, 2016. I don't know. It. I'm seeing here, according to Wikipedia, she was a member of the U.S. House from 20, January 3rd, 2013 to January 3rd, 2021. And she was the vice chair of the DNC from 2013 to 2016. So she stepped down from that chair after 2016. Not Heisenberg says, hi, Joe. Can you help this guy <laughs> explain the customs of Perm? My wife received pictures of her boss's Perm family. Was he fishing for her religion or is this a custom? Oh, that is a custom. We all dress up. I dress up every year. I've, in fact, I've appeared on stream drunk and dressed up in costume. Um, the concept behind Purim is that it's a very, very festive holiday where it's actually God using natural, what seems like natural forces to effectuate miraculous events. And it's a recognition, it's designed to recognize that that God's hand is in controlling everything that happens in the world, even though we don't really see it. That's what really ultimately the, the, the lesson of Purim is about. In this particular instance, that guiding hand led from the potential destruction of Jews across the globe to a destruction of their enemies, like a 180 degree flip. So part of the way that we celebrate that is that we dress in costume to be like different than what we are, like 180 flip from what we are the rest of the year. That's what I understand the purpose of the costumes are. Even though it's not really something we discuss a lot as to why is it we dress up. Most things that we celebrate in our, most parts of our heritage, we do, we, we go into great discussion as to why we're doing it. The whole dressing up is not a mandatory thing. Certain, most things that happen in Judaism are mandatory. It's really an optional thing, but it's become a very widely accepted practice. Children invariably dress up. Many adults dress up. I dress up. I've dressed up every, pretty much every year on Purim, including this year, where I dressed up as a monkey that fell out of, that jumped on a bed and bumped his head. As did the rest of my family. So there you go. 
just because Elon's popularity shifted left to right doesn't mean he did. I think it's more likely the populist right would be libs in the 90s. That's possible. Still considered a shift, though, isn't it? He didn't go with the rest of the left when they shifted to the left. I think Canada's trying to follow the money. It's possible. Her last term was Congress Session 116. Impeachment voting took place in Congress Session 117 when she was in office. Links on locals. Prospering woman's not giving up on this one. Not giving up. You know what? I'm going to Google. Did Tulsi vote to impeach Trump? I can't go to locals. According to USA Today, I could not in good conscience vote either yes or no. The only Democrat or Republican to vote present to impeach President Donald Trump in the House on Tuesday on both articles of impeachment was Hawaiian Representative Tulsi Gabbard. So there you go. That was on the first impeachment in 2019. The second impeachment happened after she was out of office. That's correct. That happened in 2021 after she left office. The first one she voted present. So I think you're correct because she left in 2021. And the, and the January 3rd, 2021. And that vote happened after she left in 2021, like two days after she left. Um, all right, so I want to hear her thoughts with respect to potentially becoming Trump's vice presidential running mate. So you've been um, in a lot of different news stories uh, talked about as a potential VP choice for Trump. I have no idea if that's going to happen or not. Probably unknowable. <laughs> are you open to that if you don't do that? What else are you open to? What's your plan? Um, yeah, I would I would be honored. I'd be honored to to serve our country uh, in that way or in other ways, um, and to be in a. That's a hard yes. Yes, please, 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 Donald, please. That's what that is. I'd be open to it. You know, probably would accept that 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 dance card invitation position to to help president trump if he's if he is reelected uh to actually address these challenges to help execute those policies that will bring back a secure border that will breathe new life into uh, our economy and start to get this radical inflation uh, out of control which uh, on that note I, I was in a conversation the other day with like two different groups of people uh, one, one was with uh, a very, very wealthy couple and they were saying, well, gosh, you know, and, and they're not fans of president Biden either, but like, you know, the economy is not actually that bad. The stock market's doing all right. And, you know, it's, it's not really as bad as a lot of people are saying it is. Um, and then the next conversation was with, uh, people who are not part of that, that wealthy class who were talking about, you know, it, it, a loaf of bread is three times more expensive today than it was six months ago or a year ago, basic necessities, electricity, uh, food, medicine, all of the things that, that people need just to live and, and to try to live in a healthy way, uh, are far more expensive, but they're not making a whole lot more. The dollar is going, uh, you know, not, not going nearly as far as it needs to in order to be able to afford this inflation. And so I, I just mentioned that because this disconnect still continues between the elite in Washington uh, and the reality that they live in versus the reality that the rest of us live in in this country. And, and President Trump recognizes that. I'd love to be in a position to help um, to help secure our country and to get us off this path towards World War III and nuclear war that uh, the Democrat elite and President Biden's policies have us on.
right now. So my last question a lot uh, so has been... The short answer is yes, definitely. And here's how I would be helpful and why I would be a great choice. That's essentially what she was, she was throwing out there. So if you're wondering whether or not Tulsi is interested in the job, she confirms, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Please, yes, please, yes. Definitely, please, please, please. That's what she's saying to Donald. I'd love to be your running mate. And I think that what... I think that... <sighs> question is... I know that some of you might have feelings about her. You might have feelings about, about her or not. Like that you don't trust her or whatever. And... That's your that's completely your prerogative. I have trust issues with her also. I have, I have trust issues with her. She does come across as someone who's motivated by integrity. I mean, Tucker identified that, and I think that's a fair statement. If she's motivated by integrity in the past, here's an argument to support Tulsi Gabbard. Okay. She had the opportunity to basically sell her integrity for money by basically becoming the queen of the Democratic Party. If she was so inclined, if she was so inclined, she had the opportunity that few have, very few have, to basically become the queen of the Democratic Party. She was, as a freshman in Congress, the Democrats thrust her into the spotlight, said, here's our new pretty lady to throw it at you. She's intelligent and she's, you know, expressing values and perspectives that we agree with. And here she is, and she's our new future superstar. And they, they really threw her into the limelight and hailed her as, you know, their next messianic figure to potentially take over for, for Obama one day. And she bucked that because she didn't like certain things within the, 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 the democratic system. Which is a reflection of someone who has genuine integrity. Obviously, the trappings of everything DC has to offer were at her they were at her disposal all she had to do was reach out and take it and basically bend the knee to whatever policies the powers that be would push her toward and she said no I don't think there's a lot of people who are like that I think that's a that's a rare display of integrity in in DC does that mean that I like where she stands on her politics uh, I might not love everything I mean, I love everything, but I can respect the fact that she has displayed integrity in ways that most people in Washington have not had an opportunity to display, and those who have had that opportunity seem to have been sellouts. At or around the time, let's put it this way. I want to point this out to you, okay? Here's something that you should consider. Put yourself back 10 years. 10, 11 years, 2013, 2014, chances are very, very high, very high that you were a big fan of Dan Crenshaw then and did not like Tulsi Gabbard. And oh, have those two flip-flopped. And you have to add, and why is that? And the reason is that we saw him be a sellout, a complete and total sellout. And she wasn't. So are you going to love all her politics? Probably not. There's probably very few in Washington who you love all their politics, but she definitely has displayed more integrity than most. And there's something to be said for that, especially in an environment which breeds. It breeds and, and tries to draw out the snake within each of us. It tries to draw Satan out of you, and she managed to. She managed to, you know, stay fairly true to her ideals. Now, do you agree with her ideals? Maybe not perfectly, but you can respect that. I think probably more than someone who's going to be a sellout to the highest bidder, who might be saying things you like today, but. We'll stop saying it as soon as someone pays them enough money to say something otherwise. So in that sense, there's what to appreciate about her. I also think that she definitely, to, to my mind, there are a few people who are not currently Trump voters who are likely to transition into becoming Trump voters, more enthused to actually 
go from being frustrated with Biden to actually punching a vote for Trump. How many people are there out there who have that capacity to do that for more than like 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 people? And she's definitely one of them. She's definitely one of them. You can't, I'll, I'll, I'll be forever convinced that the number of votes that she would help bring in for Trump is probably closer to seven figures than it is six. I don't know if it's that many. I don't know if it's that many. I, I'm positive it's in the tens of thousands. I'd be surprised if it wasn't well into the hundreds of thousands of people who are like enough of a supporter of Tulsi and enough disenfranchised with Biden but not liking Trump, that they'll sit there basically, you know, punching that ticket for Trump and praying that he drops dead. God forbid. But that's what they'll, they'll be praying for. Um, My mom's family were our Jewish in the Black Forest in Germany, but don't practice nor was raised Jewish. My company says I'm Jewish. Yeah. Yeah, most people would say that. You tend to go by the mother. So there you go. Candace is like Saquon. Contract was up and signed with another team. She just needs to be dramatic. Ari Jacobs did video on it. Three-year contract is up. That's very possible. I don't know Ari Jacobs. Maybe you can share that with me. All right, Hans says, posted my take on locals on Jesus King controversy and how it's okay all over again. Okay, I appreciate you checking that out. I'll, I'll try I'll try to look at that. I joined, um, Postman says, I joined locals and you cover Ron and McRomney. Lousy timing, I guess. At least the news is good. McRomney's fired, suing everyone who defamed her. They aren't enough fiat dollars left in the, in the Fed FDIC. <laughs> They really aren't enough fiat dollars. And it says RFK is VP or Tulsi gets Trump votes. Tim Scott gets Trump zero. Oh, RFK as VP or Tulsi gets Trump votes. Tim, Tim Scott gets Trump zero. I think I think RFK would get him votes. I don't know if RFK would be interested in running with Trump. I'd be curious about it. I'd be curious about that. Hans says, was Trump far left or just understood where his bread is buttered? I don't know. He seemed pretty pro-choice. He seemed pretty pro-choice. Hans, Hans once says, could just be streamless disconnect on YouTube. Rumble had not had not an issue. I don't know. I don't know what the hell happened. I don't think it was Tucker, though. I'm going I'm to give Tucker the benefit of the doubt that it had nothing to do with him. I don't think it had anything to do with him. Hands one saying the following is a cult change in my mind. It's not at all a cult type of cult. All right. I think that's my show for tonight. I am going to do a quick poll. Quick poll. Quick poll before I go. Where was I? I lost it. I have to open it again. Here it is. Um, okay. Who helps add to Trump vote totals? The most. I'm going to have RFK, Tulsi, or other. RFK, Tulsi, or other. And
Who is VP helps add the Trump vote toast the most? RK, Tulsi, or other? And go. I'm going to check out what you guys are saying in Rumble. If you think RFK adds the vote total the most, give a one, two for Tulsi, three for other. One for RFK, two for Tulsi, three for other. And go. Meanwhile, let me get this last couple of chats here. Thomas Percival says, if the following program had a theme song, what genre of music do you and all the diggers envision? It's not a cult type of cult without a proper jingle. This is true. <coughs> um, I'm thinking 70s. That was a culty era. Right? I think 70s would be right. Like cream. Or queen. That's what I'm thinking. Whole bunch of threes. Whole bunch of threes. Backdoor Biden says he's a sex and drug addict. Has he recovered from both? Supposedly he kept a diary of his sex capades. Would we want Hunter Biden as VP if he claimed he was cured? Oh, God, no. You see, he has no accomplishment, though, at all. He has no accomplishments at all. He has no integrity, no values at all. Okay, so I want to see some names from you guys in the in in Rumble. Those of you who hit three, like crime skills, tugging me tubbing, tugging me tubin. <laughs> For uh, Aussie Mark, who do you think would add to his vote total more? You think people are going to vote for Vivek more if he has Vivek there? You don't think that anyone who would vote for him already is already happy? They're okay without it being Vivek? Because that's what I'm looking at when I'm talking about adding to his vote total. Let's be someone who's like not ready to punch the ticket for him. Maybe that's true. I don't know. I'll tell you this. The early, round, early returns in voting, Tulsi and other are neck and neck. At 41 and 44 on YouTube. Send two pics on X of my perm costume. Let me check out what what's his face was saying on his whole king thing. I'm saying I'm anti Semitic because I say Jesus is king. Am I racist because I use the OK sign? Both are the same thing. One was 4chan joke, one was Nick F Association. Both are left taking words and trying to redefine words. Intent matters. Words themselves are not racist or anti Semitic. This time, Daily Wire took the bait. Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. They'll send me a demo. They'll send me a demo. I love when people do that. That'd be awesome. That'd be phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. I need intro or I need intro music. I need outro music. I need lots of music. Jim Jones hit drink the Kool-Aid. Well, that's not bad. That's not bad. But there's no Kool-Aid here, obviously. There's no Kool-Aid. All right. I think it's time. I think I'm hitting that time. I'm at the three. I'm nearly at the three hour. He announced his own VP today, so he's out. He announced his own VP. Who is his VP? Let me see. RFK VP choice. Let me see what we got here. Nicole Shanahan? Who the heck is Nicole Shanahan?
If you're flummoxed by why RFK Jr. has picked Nicole Shanahan, a person no one has ever heard of, to be his VP, understand this. This is purely because she's the only person capable of self-funding to pay for ballot access that was willing to pay, say yes to him. RFK Jr. I'm confident there's no American more qualified to play this role of Vice President Nicole Shanahan. Show me you'll do anything for campaign money without saying that you'll do anything for campaign money. <laughs> She's the ex-wife of a Google founder who, with one small $4 million donation of a Super Bowl ad, landed the shot of a lifetime. Oh, she's the one who ran the RFK ad? She's right out of Global Essential Casting. Hashtag fail. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Uh, this did not go well for Nicole. It did not go well for Nicole. Shannon's right out of Global Essential Casting. Trump and Biden never used a computer. Tulsi Crusade. Bro, just announced it. Nobody cares. Hashtag fail. Tower pick improves how meaningless the words can be. The girl that leads Sergi. Tower will pick. No, Nicola has her heart of gold. She's donated 25K to Biden's victory fund. Her biggest achievement was marrying into Google. Good luck. You're going to need it. I'm out. Kristen Cinema would have been a a million times better. So his fans are not having it. They're not very excited by this. Not very excited. Yeah. All right. Well, no more RFK. And honestly, that's pretty that's a pretty bad foul. RFK as running mate prevents him from splitting votes away from Trump. I don't know how much he's splitting away. I think he hurt himself today. I think he hurt himself. All right, my friends. It's time for me to to land my plane here. Han says the former liberals is who Trump needs to pull in. The Blue Dog Democrats. I think Tulsi is it. I think that's Tulsi. I think that's who. I think that Tulsi's it. It also shows like he's willing to go to a Democrat, a former Democrat. It's a very unifying pick. Very unifying pick. I think it's a shrewd move. I think it's a shrewd move. Do I love her as vice president? No. But he's got to win. He's got to win. And I think she gives him a better chance to win than most people. So I'm not saying I want him to pick her. But I am saying I would be okay with it. That's where I'm at on it. I'd be okay with Tulsi. I'd be okay with it. All right. And you guys seem to be okay with it too. As I close out my, as I close out my, uh, my ballot there. Where was it? 47% say other, 40% say Tulsi, 14% say RFK. All right, my friends. This is a good show. I had a good time. We got to hang out with Legal Vices. All in all, a good time was had by all. Make sure you hit like, subscribe. Check out goodlodge.locals.com. I plan on doing another show on playback tomorrow. Cramming in the playback. Not kidding. Cramming it in. I will see you there tomorrow. You're only going to hear about it really, really guarantee you'll hear about it if you sign up at Locals, which is goodlogic.locals.com. I will see you all over there. Remember, my friends, it's all about greater community, unity, and personal growth. Stay happy. No matter what they tell you, do not eat the bugs. And as always, my friends, good night and Godspeed. <laughs>